I'm calling back to order this meeting of the Sacramento City Unified School District Board of Education. Like it's not on. Hello. If we can please have quiet, thank you. I'm calling back to order this meeting of the Sacramento City Unified School District Board of Education. If we can please have our broadcast statement read by student member, board member Nguyen. This meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T Uverse. Today's meeting will air Monday, June 11th at noon and Wednesday, June 13th at 6 p.m. and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. We welcome members of the audience to address the board. Please complete a speaker form located in the back of the community room and give them to our communications representative along with any handouts that you may have for the board prior to the conclusion of the item's presentation. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Please limit comments during public comment to items that are not on the agenda. If you do comment on an item that is on the agenda, we will ask that you please defer your comments until your item comes up on the agenda. Please also turn off your cell phones or place them on silent or vibrate. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Nguyen. Tonight's Pledge of Allegiance will be led by the Sacramento New Tech Championship in Forestry Challenge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you can please remain at the front. Board member Daryl Wu will be uh, presenting you with a certificate in recognition of your tremendous efforts. Thank you, President Ryan. So I wanted to announce, as you probably all know, students from Sacramento New Tech High have won the Forestry Challenge Championship. Francisco Franco Torres, David Candia, and Michael Rafanon of Sacramento New Tech High School, one group of a total of 41 High school students from nine schools from all over California recently won the Forestry Challenge Championship. The event was at April was on uh, April 19th through the 21st at Camp Sylvester Resort, east of Sonora, California. One of the highlights for the students this year was the opportunity to recommend a silver culture prescription for the Lions Track Unit owned by Sierra Pacific Industries. After spending a day in the forest collecting data and interacting with natural resource professionals, students recommended a prescription that would be practical, economically sound, and in compliance with the California forest practice rules. During the challenge, teams of students also completed a field test to assess their technical forestry knowledge and data collecting skills. Forestry Challenge provides a learning opportunity about California's most valuable resource, our forests. Learners are engaged in the complex responsibility of understanding and making decisions about the environmental and economic factors involved in keeping our forests healthy, said New Tech High School teacher Senna Vasquez. David Candia, a junior at New Tech, summed it up as follows. The skills utilized in Forestry Challenge are not only applicable in Forestry Challenge. Data analysis skills, time management skills, and presentation skills are all applicable in real world situations. With that, I present the Forestry Challenge Championship winners. Thank you. Congratulations. You, 
the gentleman have the microphone? Do don't be shy now. <laughs> Please don't feel pressured, but if you want to say a brief word, you you should. <laughs> so we would like to thank our three marvelous coaches, uh, Mr. Wong, Ms. Vasquez, and Ms. Baker. They have I have been with them for three years. Us three actually have been with them for three years. Uh, they guided us through the whole process, and they gave us the opportunity to be to be part of a team together. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Board member Wu is going to be coming down to present you with a certificate and to take a quick photo. And before I do that, may I call up Jessica Parkland from the Forestry Challenge? I think she has something for you guys as well. Hello, I'm Jessica Parlin from the Forestry Challenge. I'm here to give a few awards. I would like to award David Candia, Francisco Torres, and Michael Raffanon first place in the 2017 Forestry Challenge Championships. This team earned the highest combined score on their forestry field test and their focus topic presentation, where they gave their very well thought out, I, in my personal opinion, civil cultural prescription for the Lions Tract. Um, they are receiving a personalized uh, first place plaque that is theirs to keep. Thank you all. And also the perpetual uh, championship trophy, which has their school name, Sacramento New Technology High School, and must be returned. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations and good work, guys. You had a good teacher. Congratulations again, and thank you, Board Member Wu. Item 5.0, announcement of action taken in closed session. Uh, yes, Madam President, there are four announcements out of closed session. The uh, last announcement will be made by the superintendent regarding Rosa Parks. My announcements are as follows. By a, uh, a vote of 5 to 0 with... Uh, board members uh, Bang and ha Hansen absent. The board uh, approved the following actions. Uh, special education uh, settlements in OEH case number 2018-020890 and a separate uh, action 2018-030255. In connection with expulsion 13, uh, the board approved by the same vote the compromise and release agreement regarding this special education expulsion matter. I will now defer to the superintendent for his announcement. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I'm pleased to announce that the board, by unanimous vote of 5-0 to zero with board member Vang and board member Hansen absent, Approve the appointment of Mr. Corey Jones as Principal Rosa Parks K-8 School. Thank you, Superintendent Aguilar. Item 6.0, Agenda Adoption. Tonight's agenda will be adopted in memory of John F. Kennedy teacher, Redder St. John. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Today, I have the honor of opening this board meeting 
in memory of a beloved teacher. These words were prepared for me by John F. Kennedy Principal David Van Nant. After a stunning 47 years as a teacher and a scientist extraordinaire at John F. Kennedy, the loss of Ritter St. John is as surreal as it is hard to accept. The Kennedy community unites to honor an expert educator who inspired generations with her spirit, passion, integrity, and above all else, an intense concern for her students. With a tenure that bridged nine U.S. presidents, 18 Sacramento City superintendents, and 12 John F. Kennedy principals, thousands of young people left Miss St. John's classroom, better students, better citizens, and better human beings. In the words of a former student from the class of 1980, she empowered me to work hard, dream big, and never settle for anything short of the best. The person I am today is a direct reflection of Miss St. John. Tonight, the school she loves for so long misses her. Its hallways empty and saddened by an unexpected exit. But her legacy bears testament to the power of a teacher. We thank Redder St. John for her tireless service, and we vow to hold her memory close to our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wu. That's a beautiful tribute. In, in addition, I wanted to say that I have in front of me a letter to Miss St. John, dated August 24th, 1971, offering her her job as a first-year probationary teacher in science at John F. Kennedy, brand new position, 47 years. Imagine. I only wish that she would have come to, Ken to John F. Kennedy two years earlier because my life would probably have been different as well. I'd probably <laughs> be a doctor today instead of a lawyer. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Ritter, for all you've done for all of our thousands of children. Absolutely. Thank you. Item 7.0, special presentation 7.1, the seal of biliteracy recognition, which will be presented by Dr. Iris Taylor. And I'm going to quickly turn this over to Vanessa Gerard, our multilingual director. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Good evening, President Ryan, members of the board, Superintendent Aguilar. As the Director of Multilingual Literacy, it is my distinct pleasure to <clears throat> bring forward our district's seal of biliteracy recipients um, for you to recognize tonight. Um, we have invited the DLAC President, Maria Flores, and the Vice President, Teresa Hernandez, um, to give our brief introduction on the seal. Thank you. I'm speaking Spanish. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es María Flores, presidenta del Comité de DILAC. Esta noche honramos a los estudiantes al galardón del sello de lectores y escritura bilingüe, graduados del 12 grado, que han demostrado la excelencia en inglés y en otro idioma. Tonight we, on, tonight we honor uh, the recipients of the California State Seal of Biliteracy, B, uh, B graduating, graduating seniors who have demonstrated excellence, excellence in English and in another world language. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Teresa Hernández y soy la vicepresidente del Comité de ILECA. Estos estudiantes han demostrado arduamente no solo ser estudiantes bilingües, sino también ser proficientemente en un segundo idioma y están especialmente preparados para ejercer cualquier pos, pos secundario que tomen. Ahora la señora Vanessa nos presentará a los estudiantes honrados. Gracias. These students have, have worked hard to become not only bilingual but biliterate literate, and are especially well prepared to pursue any post-secondary choices they make. Ms. Giral will now introduce the students. Thank you. 
Thank you. We have before us a small sampling of the students who were awarded the State Seal of Biliteracy. That number is 269. But you know, graduating seniors are busy people. <laughs> and we have a, a wonderful cadre here to represent our entire um, uh, group of, of Seal of Biliteracy recipients. <clears throat> Fatima Ariaga, Luther Burbank, Spanish. Melanie Diaz, School of Engineering and Science, Spanish. <laughs> Yili Lai Mua, John F. Kennedy, Hmong. <laughs> Concepcion Morales, John F. Kennedy, Spanish. <laughs> Mariela Madrano, John F. Kennedy, Spanish. Sarah Cerda, John F. Kennedy, Spanish. Adriana Navarro, John F. Kennedy, Japanese. Edgar Chavez Godinez, Luther Burbank, Spanish. Zachary G., John F. Kennedy, Latin. Diana Franco, John F. Kennedy, Spanish. <laughs> Rija Tariq, C.K. McClatchy, Urdu. <laughs> Honey Zhang, John F. Kennedy, Japanese. <laughs> Jer Vang, Luther Burbank, Hmong. Francisco Franco Torres, New Tech, Spanish. Thank you very much for helping me recognize these outstanding scholars. Thank you so much. We appreciate your efforts and congratulations on your tremendous achievement. Item 7.2, District Green Apple Awards. Tonight's presentation will be done by Kathy Allen and Rachel Shard. Good evening, uh, President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, members of the board. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm here tonight to announce our Green if Apple. If I can please ask everyone to, to quiet down so we can hear our staff. Thank you so much. I'm here tonight to honor those who go above and beyond in making our learning environments more green and sustainable. Tonight we have four awards that we'll be giving away. Um, I'll ask that they stand when I say their name and then join us after all four have been presented um, and then invite those members of the board to come and take a photo. I don't know. We'll get the slide working. We're not. I'll let you work on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tonight's uh, first award is Green Educator of the Year. Um, this award goes to Julie Schneider. She's an environmental studies teacher at Rosemont High School. Ms. Snyder is a veteran teacher in our district who shares her passion and dedication to the environment with her students. At Rosemont, Ms. Schneider provides hands-on learning opportunities and develops interesting projects for her students through the use of the school garden. In addition to agricultural practices like companion planting and crop health, she is able to use the garden to teach students about the importance of water conservation and composting. Our second award tonight is for Green Administrator of the Year. This award goes to Liz Hill, the principal at Rosemont High School. Uh, Ms. Beehill is an advocate at Rosemont for responsible site management and an agent for change. Uh, she proudly supports her team of staff, including Ms. Snyder, um, who are passionate about being environmentally aware and dedicated to providing 21st century learning opportunities for all students. Ms. Beehill promotes sustainability efforts by organizing tours that showcase their on-site garden and working with community partners such as SMUD and the Sacramento Tree Foundation to improve beautification on campus. 
Our third award for the evening uh, is the Green Operations Staff of the Year. This award goes to Elizabeth Brown. She is the plant manager at Wilsey Wood Middle School. Ms. Brown is an integral part of the team at Wilsey Wood and often goes above and beyond her designated duties to support the school's sustainability efforts. She has been instrumental in helping the Spartan Club prep raised beds, replant trees, and install water catchment system on campus. On weekends and even during breaks, Ms. Brown spends time organizing volunteers of students from Wilsey Wood and other Sacramento City Unified Schools to keep all the plants watered and the beds pruned um, and weeded. The last award tonight uh, is the Green Team of the, of the Year Award. This award goes to the Project Green Team at Kit Carson. This year was Kit Carson's third year participating in Project Green. With the help of their school nurse, Miss um, Jones, the Project Green team is made up of eighth grade gate science students who took on an ambitious list of projects this year. The team expanded sustainability curriculum in the classroom, <laughs> invited multiple guest speakers to the school, received a grant to start a garden, increased recycling on campus, and started a food waste cafeteria program during lunch. All of those things in one year. <laughs> So I'd like to invite all of the award recipients up here um, to accept your awards. I'd like to make a special point. Uh, these Green Apple Awards were created with the help of our facilities operations staff. So the base of them was actually created by our carpenter shop. They were painted by our paint shop, and the sign was done by our sign shop. So they are very special and unique for each individual recipient. We're moving on to item 7.4, the, oh, sorry, 7.3, the Classified Champions Award, which will be presented by Cansey McCarn and Christina Viegas. Actually, this, um, this is going to be presented by Christina Viegas with our labor partners joining her in the presentation, Carla Fawcett and Mike Preverly. Thank you. And once again, if I can please ask for quiet in the chamber so we can hear the presentations of our wonderful classified staff. Good evening, um, Board President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, and board members. My name is Christina Villegas. I'm HR Director for the district. And tonight, uh, we will be honoring 13 of our classified employees who have gone above and beyond their duties and who deserve the recognition for their dedication to the district as well as their commitment in helping promote the continuous educational services to our students. These employees were nominated by their peers, parents, students, and administrators based on their beyond the call of duty service and commitment to our students. We are excited and honored to present these awards to our 13 classified champion winners for the 18-19 school year. Okay, Our, I want, as, as I name each of the winners, 13 winners, if when they come up, if they can remain up here after they obtain their award. Uh, the first person is Nicole Adams, who currently works at 
Rosemont High School as a clerk three has been with the district for 20 years. Okay. Uh, next is Alma Avalos Mejia, who works as a family partnership facilitator for the Family and Community Empowerment Department, has been with the district for three years. Yes. Next, we have Cynthia Ayala who works at Bret Hart Elementary as a school office manager and has been with us for over a year. <laughs> Next, we have Sarah Castro, who works at Fern Bacon Middle School as an office technician, too, and has been with the district for over five years. Next, we have Esther Guzman, who works at Hiram Johnson High School as a custodian, has been with the district for over 15 years. Aw, look how beautiful she looks. Aww. Next, we have William Hendricks, who works in the Technology Services Department as a Technology Support Specialist, too, has been with the district for over 18 years. Next, we have Alice Hernandez, who works at C.K. McClatchy High School as a school office manager three, has been with the district for over 34 years. Wow. Next, we have James Hunter, who works at Sam Brennan Middle School as a custodian, has been with the district for over 10 years. Next, we have Linda Liu, who works at Hubert H. Bancroft Elementary School as an instructional aide, special education, has been with the district for over 11 years. <laughs> Next, we have Michelle Morrison, who works at Hubert H. Bancroft Elementary School as an instructional aide, special ed for over four years. Next, we have Arwen Renda, who works at Fern Bacon Middle School as a school office manager, too, for over 10 years with the district. <laughs> Next is Juan Romero, who works at Hubert H. Bancroft Elementary School as a custodian for over one year. And next and last is Becky Sorensen, who works at Hubert H. Bancroft Elementary School as a food service assistant three, has been with the district for over 17 years. I want to give a great big congratulations to all of our 13 Classified Champion winners, and thank you so much for sharing this moment with all of us. Which I think is a great idea. I love that.
Moving right along, item 7.4, the Teacher of the Year Award. Thank you, Board President Ryan. And if I can ask for quiet in the chamber once again so we can recognize our hardworking Teacher of the Year. Thank you, Board President Ryan. This is going to be presented by Dr. Tiffany Smith-Simmons, HR Director and SETA President David Fisher. Good evening, Board. I am Tiffany Smith-Simmons, and I'm proud to stand here with David Fisher, our SETA President. Yeah, um, yeah, I think I've heard a lot of different definitions of teaching, but one of them I heard from our National Education Association president was that it's a fierce act of love. And you can get down to the second definition of fierce, and it talks about doing something with heartfelt intensity. And I know that these teachers and all our teachers um, teach that way, and I'm just really proud to be here to be able to present this award, these awards tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Thank you, David. Coupled with David's comments, I would like to say a, a bit about the teachers. Some say that teaching is simply a profession, but it's really a calling. Teachers see what everyone else fails to see. They believe when nobody ever did, and they tell us not to settle. Teachers change lives. In a world which is constantly forcing you to become everything that you are not, where you are surrounded by imposters, teachers help you march to the beat of your own drum, and that's how they change lives. It is my privilege to honor our Teachers of the Year. I had the privilege of speaking to one of the, well, both of the classes, but I'm really, really excited to see the little ones behind me. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask them to join me up here because I asked them to come. <laughs> We're fortunate to have so many, many wonderful, amazing educators who continue to raise the bar for what it means to be a great teacher. We are honored to have a dedicated Teacher of the Year Selection Committee, which includes our own former Teachers of the Year, along with members of our SCTA bargaining team, as well as principals. They go through a rigorous process, which includes nominations that we received from December to February this year, and then we review applications, we interview them, and then we go and observe to see what they said in their essay, as long as what they said in their interview really matches their practice in their classrooms. Tonight, we are here to honor Leslie McAfee. <laughs> Leslie McAfee has taught in Sac City for 17 years, and she teaches first grade currently at Crocker Riverside. Join me again in congratulating Leslie. Next, we are pleased and honored to recognize Brandon Parker, a language arts teacher at Einstein Middle School. He has taught and coached track for eight years in our district. Every year, we have the opportunity to select teachers who we feel make a positive impact in the lives of our students we serve. Although we have many people who do this on a daily basis, we are pleased to recognize these two Teachers of the Year for the 18-19 school year. Later this year, or in the summer, they're going to work hard to prepare their documents and application 
to compete in the countywide Sacramento Teacher of the Year, and they will be recognized at the banquet in August of 2018. Please join me in congratulating Leslie and Brandon. Now, Ms. McAfee's class, will you join us up here, please? So cute. Oh, I love it. As we're congratulating the two Teachers of the Year, we are honored to have the Sacramento County Teacher of the Year in attendance and happens to be a Sac City teacher. So, Ms. Siegert, will you please come up too? Thank you again, everyone. Congratulations again to our hardworking teachers. We thank you for everything you do day in and day out. We're moving on to item 7.5, approving resolution number 3016 in recognition of LGBTQ. Pride Month, June 2018, which will be presented by board member Michael Minnick. Thank you, President Ryan. Um, well, for our little first graders, clap once if you can hear us. Clap twice if you can hear us. Awesome. <laughs> nice job, President Ryan. I see a <laughs> second career for you. Uh, um, can I have... Uh, uh, Nicole Wolford from the Connect Center and Doug Husher join us up front, please. So I am very, um, very thrilled and honored to present a resolution uh, for LGBTQ plus uh, Pride Month here at Sac City Unified. Um, as uh, someone who had long before sitting up here, spent a lot of time at the uh, LGBTQ task force at the district. I know that our district is doing some incredible work to support all of our students. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that the Connect Center provides all types of support for our LGBTQ plus students, um, uh, support to the gay straight alliances or whatever the uh, clubs choose to call themselves at different schools, um, and our Connect Center is unlike any other program anywhere in the amount of uh, support that they provide to our, to our students. So I am very excited to present this uh, resolution 
uh, for the work that's going on here in our um, district and uh, to show our um, support uh, for all of our students. So I, um, I have the uh, resolution here with me, and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I did um, pick out a few of the um, legal, uh, legal stuff here. Um, so in recognition of LGBTQ plus Pride Month, June 2018, whereas the district is committed to providing a safe haven for all students, including the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning community, or those that may be perceived as such, Whereas the month of June is an opportunity to highlight the identities and contributions of the LGBTQ community. Whereas the Connect Center is a critical district program for student, staff, and community resources, the Connect Center provides trainings, activities, and lessons for and about LGBTQ plus identities and is committed to fostering a safe and respectful district, school, and community culture. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Sacramento City Unified Board of Education declares June 2018 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month and directs the superintendent and all district staff to support lessons, activities, and conversations that engage students in meaningful learning, research, and writing about our LGBTQ plus students and families. Thank you very much. If you'd like to say anything, and then, and then I'll come down with the... Good evening, board. I just want to thank you so much for all of your support and to everyone in this room and throughout this district. It has been uh, 11, since 2011 when the Connect Center began, and our programs have continued to unfold to be able to provide our critical resources and support to students throughout our district. Um, it has just been my honor to be able to work in this program, to work with so many people throughout the district, um, to be able to support the teachers and um, people throughout the district who support these students, and to be able to really understand their critical and unique needs and have the school district and the Board of Education support this very small but vulnerable population of students is just, it just warms my heart. So thank you so much. For German. <laughs> We want to thank you again for all of your wonderful service. In many way, what, ways, what you're doing at the Connect Center represents the heartbeat of the work within Sac City Unified, and we appreciate your leadership. Um, we are moving on to item, item 8.0, public comment. I do want to mention this is public comment on all non-agendized items, given uh, the volume of items that we'll be discussing tonight. I ask that our speakers limit their comments to one minute each, and we will be fairly uh, guarded on time. We have 15 public comments. We just had nine more cards submitted, so we have 24 public comments. So we comments have 24 now. public comments. You, I do want to say, if we have multiple speakers on a single item, you can combine your time. So I'll read them. Can we start with you on this public comment? Okay. Um, we have a public comment in item 7.5. Okay. So we're going to uh, go back to item 7.5. Angel? Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm going to try to not get emotional because this um, population of students and this topic really warms my heart. So one, um, uh, I want to thank the board, superintendent, um, board president for developing this resolution um, because it's, it's, it, it is something that's really, really important to our most vulnerable, <laughs> try, most vulnerable group of students. Being traumatized at school shouldn't be part of the experience of getting an education. 
A recent case in Southern California addressed the issues surrounding learning and trauma. You have to address trauma in order to do anything about the achievement gap, said Ann Hudson Price, an attorney with public counsel who represents the students in Southern California. She adds that learning requires a state of attentive calm, but, that, but it's one that traumatized kids rarely, if ever, achieve. Too often, LGBT students are harassed, bullied, and even assaulted. As discussed in the resolutions, they have a high rate of suicidal ideation and mental health issues due to the stigma. They deserve better. Schools must ensure in every way that all students are safe from policy to practice. From administrators to yard duties to office staff, simply having an assembly, putting up posters, and doing a once a month lesson on LGBT leaders does little to address these issues. St students must see themselves reflected and honored on their campuses. They must feel valued and cared for. These concerns must not be dismissed. Additionally, Full implementation of the FAIR Act needs to be measured in the SIPSAs. Also, this exact statement in the Pride Resolution needs to also be added to the Disability History Week resolution that was developed in October 2016, which included full implementation of the FAIR Act. So I'm asking that you amend um, the FAIR Act sec sec section in the Disability History Week resolution to to. Um, to state your commitment to the full implementation of the FAIR Act. Again, I want to thank the board for developing this resolution. I just hope that there will be teeth to the written document. As a parent of an LGBT youth, his and other kids' lives depend on these real changes. Thank you very much, Angel. I, I do want to say that we are proud as a board right now to be working on a, chan, a transgender bathroom policy, which we hope to be bringing before the board um, in short order. In addition, I do want to invite the community to join the majority of board members in marching on Sunday alongside the superintendent in honor of Pride Day. We are now going to be moving on to item 8.0, public comment. And as I shared, it will be one minute per speaker unless you choose to combine your minutes on a single topic. I'm going to go ahead and read the first 12, and then once we get through the first 12, I'll call up the next. Um, in order, please line up when you hear your name. Enoch Young, Lori Liu, Ryan Fong, Virginia Sai, Mira Young, Brianna Kitcher, Symphony Edwards, Sherilyn Dalton, Renner Johnson, Chip Powell, Quincy Johnson, and Angela Ash. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Enoch Young. I'm a parent at William Land Elementary School, and I'm here to um, just encourage the, the, the board to be considering continuing pathways for the MIP program. Um, we've been working uh, very hard with um, Jorge Aguilar, as well as the district staff, to figure out a way to, to, to continue the MIP pathways on to junior high and high school. Um, we understand that, you know, Part of the issue is how do you fiscally justify a full-time teacher to teach that, that first grade, that sixth grade cohort. And so I'm really here to encourage the, the board to um, take a long-term view and say that, hey, it is an investment. And if we look at it from a long-term perspective, it will be financially justifiable. I'm here to um, encourage, uh, invite some of the students and parents to kind of share uh, their perspective on, on why the program should continue. Okay. Um, I'll have Virginia come on up. I mean, Amy. If we can please have the clock reset. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm one of the parents um, of a child in the Mandarin Immersion Program. One of the, the things that attracted me about um, the school district is the fact that it's the only school district that offers Mandarin Immersion Program. And... Um, I think it's just been such an asset in terms of he's only in first grade and how much he has grasped and absorbed um, in speaking and in, in written language. Um, I think it's a great investment knowing that China is the most populous nation in the world with over one billion people. 
Um, it's also the second most powerful economy in the world, and um, it's also one of the largest trading partners of the United States. I think with the investment that's been happening, you know, ha offering the Mandarin Immersion Program for seven years, it would be such a waste to halt it and not have it continue. So as a parent, I really um, ask that the board member really prioritize it um, so that way we can foster um, this awesome opportunity. Thank you. Can I just add one more thing? I'm, um, and the other thing, just to think about, how many of you can think having two years of foreign language in high school makes you fluent in that language? And so I know when I was a student in high school, I wish that I had the opportunity to have the immersion program. And we're in 2018, this is happening, and we can't stop here. So we need to keep it going. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Virginia Tsai. I have two, two students in the MIP program at William Land. Um, my husband and I chose to, have, to enroll our students in the MIP program for both cultural and academic reasons. We believe that exposing children to a second language early on will advance their brain development uh, and also advance them socially to give them a better opportunity to become more rounded citizens of the world. It's obvious that China's seen an extraordinary rise in power in the last 30 years and it continues to progress. Their students are learning English to prepare their, their students to be leaders in the English-speaking world, and we should have the similar opportunity to, here to have our children be future global leaders. Chinese is the most commonly spoken language on the planet, and the ability to read and speak com competently will have a greater importance in their future. To have the Mandarin Immersion Program stop at sixth grade, we are cutting short our commitment to, their, to truly advancing their language skills. By extending their education past sixth grade, we will enable them to improve their Mandarin to a point where it can be used within a professional context. The language centers in the brain are still developing, and by stopping at sixth grade, we leave a large, unsatisfied gap in their education. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Wang. I'm here advocating for my son, who is in the second grade at the Mandarin Immersion Program. Uh, he just had surgery, so he can't be here. Um, I feel like the program has enriched him so much culturally, but also it's an investment for the future. As President Trump would say, it's, it's a bigly investment. Um, as a physician, on a daily basis, I wish I could be a bilingual speaker because I feel like that would give better and complete care to my patients. And I know that with the Mandarin Immersion Program at Wormland, there are many students from Natomas, Elk Grove, Roseville, uh, Folsom, who drive downtown to give to be in this program. So there is a need and a want, and I think it would be beneficial to the community to continue it in junior high and high school. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brianna Kitcher. I'm, my daughter's a third grader at William Land Elementary School. I specifically sought out a school that had a Mandarin immersion program in order to give her an edge in the workforce. It seems like this is a really popular concept that only exists in metropolitan cities and how fortunate we are in Sacramento to act, finally have a program like this. For it to stop in the sixth grade would cut it short, as mentioned before, and I will leave Sacramento to continue to provide this for my daughter, for her to have the opportunity. And I don't want to do that. I think that Sacramento is ready to have kids, young adults, enter the workforce that have the same opportunities as kids in the larger cities like San Francisco and New York. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to pull up this chair for our kids. I'm going for the jugular here. So uh, they're going to tag team. So in lieu of just a short time. So I'm going to have a, a symphony. She's going to come on up first. Um, here, here, let me pull you up closer. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we go. If we can reset the clock for five minutes since we're combining all of the students. Um, Hello, everybody. My name is Symphony. To, oh, sorry. And I am a third grader of William Land. I like going to the Man 
during an immersion program because it gives me more benefits. And since it is a, a pictographic language, I feel special because I know who languages and I love talking to people in Mandarin when we travel. Thank you. Thank you. This is Isaiah and Ryan. They're going to come up together. Hi, my name is Isaiah Yang. And my name is Ryan Fong. I have been learning Chinese at William Land for four years. I have been learning Chinese at Willem Lam for six years. Chinese has helped me with my pronunciation. Um and I gave and it gave me a challenge. The MIP program can be frustrating but will most likely help me in my career when I grow up. Chinese has helped me with many things like calligraphy, writing, speaking, and culture. I am very happy with the Mandarin Immersion Program. We, we hope, hope we can, can continue, continue learning, learning Chinese, Chinese in, in the future. future. Thank you. Xie Thank you. Hello, I am Ella Lam, and I am a third grade MIP student. Uh, Chinese has helped me during the years by helping me reduce my stress. I also read an article that learning a second language can improve memory. So maybe if we include Chinese all the way to high, sc high school from middle school, elementary school, and so on and so forth, then students might be able to do better in their tests, math, English, social studies, science, and much more. Thank you. Hi, my name is Miria. And my name is Leah. Uh, we have been learning Mandarin at William Land for six years. At this school, we learn how to read, write, and speak Chinese. We also learn the culture of China. Some exciting things we've done throughout the school year. Uh, we have done tea ceremonies, we've done calligraphy, and we've made Chinese stamps. The Mandarin program, uh, it also helps me personally and a lot of other students help with their personal lives and their personal matters. Uh, a lot of families don't know how to speak English, and so learning Eng both English and Mandarin, you can help translate. Uh, Continuing the Mandarin program to higher grade levels will help students with their future career. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor. Mandarin can help me tell people what to do if they only know Mandarin. As you can see, the MIP program helps, helps greatly in life. Continuing the Mandarin Immersion Program in higher grades will help students achieve their dreams. So we are asking you to continue the Mandarin Immersion Program to future grade levels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just conclude it here. We really need your, your help, board, to just really prioritize this. We've got a sixth grade cohort that's already enrolled in junior high, and 
there's no there's no place for them to go right now. And we are looking at feeder options. So thank you so thank much. You very much. And to our young people, you did a beautiful job tonight. Thank you. Good evening, board. I didn't think I would be here again, but I see that I am. I'm the mother that put in the OCR case against this district. Now, I put in for immediate IEP for my son on May 3rd. I have yet to hear from nobody yet. The CDE also told me about the OT and the behavioral analysis. Nobody has contacted me yet. So my name is Sherilyn Dalton. I have a wonderful principal at Rosa Park School. On May 3rd, I contacted you guys. May 17, he contacted her, which is Brittany Tom. Yesterday, I was at the school because I'm a non-hands mom, and I bumped into her. And I asked her, why is she ignoring me? I have had that in since the 3rd of May. You have a lot of time to answer this and address what I need. So we set a meeting for next week on the 13th. But I asked her to email me this so then I can tell her at that meeting, my lawyer will be there. And I don't want it to be a wasted trip. Because if yours aren't there, then we can't be heard. So I'm letting the board know, because Miss Tom didn't email me, that we had this conversation. And you know we have to keep a paper trail with this district. Thank you. And that's why I I'm asked going to... her to email me. So just so you know, February 13th, 2018, 10 o'clock, I need you there. Thank I'm going to have our board special oh, no, assistant come over and get your contact information so we can make sure we follow up. Um, I just want to remind our remaining speakers, we have one minute each given the 24 public comments that were submitted tonight. And I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you. We went a little bit out of order. My name is Chip Powell. I'm a parent of a, uh, a soon-to-be senior at CK McClatchy High School. I'm here because um, it, this was a wonderful presentation tonight. You know, Ms. Taylor presented the seal of biliteracy to all these kids. The German for the fourth year German program at McClatchy is being cut because the program is so popular and so successful and the kids are thriving and working so hard and doing so great. There's no more room for them to finish the program their fourth year to try for that seal next year. Now, I do want to thank Ms. Cochran and Mr. Minnick and also Mr. Hansen and Mr. Browning over there for communicating with us parents about this issue. And we've been told, there's a lot of us here tonight and the students too, that you guys are working on it. We don't want to abandon these kids because they're working so hard because the program is successful. We don't want to reward mediocrity. If it was a bad program, no problem. Kids would drop out along the way. It's a great program and the kids want to try for this seal, take the AP exam, put the four years on their college applications, et cetera. We, we don't think it's fair that they're not even allowed to try for that. So that's why we're here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my, my name is Renner Johnston. I'm, I'm uh, also a father of a, a child at uh, McClatchy um, who has been working hard for the last four years or for the last three years to try to get to the fourth year of German and is not able to do that and take the AP. And so I just wanted to ask that you try and find funding to uh, fill this last year and make it possible to f achieve that uh, bilingual ec excellence that you were applauding earlier this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, distinguished members of the board. My name is Quizzy Johnston. I'm currently about to enter my senior year of high school at McClatchy High School. Um, I'm pro hoping to be a fourth year German student. Um, I fortunately had the privilege of being able to decide between private and public high school. Um, three years ago when I was entering, um, I, I, yeah, three years ago when I was entering, um, I spent as much of my career in public school and I've loved it. And I chose to go to McClatchy because of its dedication to diversity um, and the wonderful programs. Um, but it also seemed like a place that would encourage me to learn. Um, however, recently this news surrounding my fellow classmates and I's language class surprised me in how it completely defied this idea. 
After three years of learning, the students in German 3 have proved to, proved to be some of the best and the brightest. The dedication is shown through their want to pursue something they love. But now, in having to come to the highest level, they're being told no. These students who simply want to learn are being refused in the face of numbers and logistic mistakes. If this, if done, would be a failure of the school system to us and my students over there. Funding a German 4 class in McClatchy High School would be appreciated and valued more for students as it is many students' only option. The transportation, time off, and luxury of driving to a far-off community college are simply not available to every student at Makashi High School. We as German students just want the chance to be competitive for good college options and the ability to continue learning a language we love. So we ask you to please consider funding a solution for Makashi High School's German 4 class. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, distinguished board members, President Ryan and uh, Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Angela Ash, and I'm here tonight to advocate for waiving a fingerprinting fees and to create greater access to this mandatory and necessary service. Currently, the cost of $47 to fingerprint one parent or guardian, the time and resources it takes to obtain the fingerprinting at the district office is prohibitive to parent participation in our schools. Other neighboring school districts like Elk Grove and San Juan Unified do not charge their parents fingerprinting fees. Uh, additionally, Washington Unified School Dif District offers mobile fingerprinting units, a service that alleviates, alleviates the transportation and access burden to its community. For this upcoming budget year, I would like to see Sac City Unified School District waive fingerprinting fees, offer extended hours at the district office, as well as mobile fingerprinting services. Several schools throughout the district could serve as fingerprinting hubs and offer several days to help parents and caregivers get fingerprinted and solve issues of access and transportation. Thank you, Ms. Ash. We so I have appreciate it. for you, and I hope that you look at it. I surveyed parents and. Yes, and we also got your email. Thank you for your Thank advocacy. You. Thank you. The next 15 public comments, please line up in order. Sonia Hendren, Kenya Martinez, Kenzie Martinez, Angel Garcia, Renee Webster Hawkins, Iran Salazar, Jorge Chavez, Jose Cervantes, Carlos Rodriguez, Carlos Rodriguez Sr., Jorge Salazar, Benjamin Lara, Fatima Arriaga, Alma Lopez, and Melissa Tal. Okay, and if we can reset the clock, thank you. My name is Sonia Hendren. We have an equity problem at William Land Elementary School. By policy, we're required to assign our free after-school spots by lottery. This lottery system gives free spots to wealthy students who are already some of the most academically privileged around, while some of our local neighborhood low-income families who cannot afford a free, um, who cannot afford a paid spot, are left with no spot at all. This system is harmful to our low-income families. It's harmful to the culture of our school, and it's working against the state of California's educational goals to increase equity and close achievement gaps. We need to change our policies on free and paid hybrid after-school programs so that when schools have limited free resources, the schools can give those resources to the students with need who will benefit the most. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Okay, I'm going to read for my son. My son's name is Kensei Martinez. Um, this is something that he wrote. I'm a student at San Bruno Middle School. I have a good family, a great little brother. I love coding. I want to be a computer programmer, and I am visually impaired. By the way, there are blind computer programmers. I just finished my eighth grade year, and we'll go to my promotion ceremony next Friday this year. At the end of the second semester, I received the grades of F in language arts and history for not turning in assignments which I didn't get in large print. My teacher failed me when I did not do anything wrong. My mom asked that I be placed in another class. I was placed in a gate class with another teacher. It was kind of hard for me at first, but at the end of the year, my grades were an A minus in language arts and a C plus in history, but I actually was one point away from getting a B. I used to hate math, but I went to tutoring and got a 92 on my final test and a B for my fourth semester grade. 
I was automatically enrolled in the summer school program, although I am on the honor roll. I'm not really a person who likes to speak, but it was important that you know my story. Thank you for sharing your story. We greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Very so, brave. I'm Kenya Martinez. I'm Ken Say's mom. I'm also a member of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. Ken Say's story is just like that of many of our students who are a part of our coalition. Um, so my question to the board today is, what are we going to do to make sure that our students are properly being served? Right now, um, I, as a parent, I've seen, I've been at Sac City Unified School District for a little over a year and a half, and I have had constant problems and issues with my son not being served. And being visually impaired or having a learning disability or whatever you may have, but especially for him, because he visual, he's visually impaired, doesn't mean that he is not qualified to learn. If you give him the support he needs, he can succeed. He has learned from himself that there are blind computer programmers who work for Apple. He's met people who work for Google who are blind computer programmers. So my question is to the board and to to Sac City Unified School District, what are you going to do? Please don't fail our students with disabilities any longer. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate your comments. I'm going to try to shorten my comments. Um, so my name is Angel Garcia. I'm also a member of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I do want to say that I watched the mayor's campaign um, to extend the use of Measure U. He wants to move it to a full cent. cent. And I want to say that I was happy to see our superintendent attending that meeting um, and announcement. Um, he talked about the different ways that, um, you know, he wants to implement the SENT increase to address the skills gap in Sacramento, to provide internships for youth. However, um, we, our district was in a partnership with Thousand Strong, and we did not reach out to the disability community, to the CAC, to students with disabilities, and we need to make sure in partnerships that we're utilizing for internships that we're preparing all students and we're giving all students the opportunity to participate in those because we know students with disabilities, after they leave, have high rates of unemployment. So as you move on toward that intern, I mean, uh, partnership, please don't forget our students with disabilities and ensure they have a seat at the table. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> Renee? Good evening, President and Superintendent, members of the board. You have a longer letter from me, and I'm glad I pre prepared it since we're limited to one minute. I represent a small group of parents of differently wired students who want to collaborate with the district to act intentionally towards a vision of universal screening, evidence-based teaching, and proactive self-empowerment at every school for the 10 to 20% of students with dyslexia and learning-based disorders. With all the initiatives that you've undertaken this year, which are bold and robust, one mountain peak needs to be scaled and conquered to seal up the school to poverty to prison pipeline and ensure equity to all of its students. Sac City must create and implement a plan to ensure that the one in five students with learning dis differences are taught effectively and empowered to succeed in every class and in every grade and in the programs that Angel just mentioned on their way to college or career of their choice. So we're ready to roll up our sleeves with you. Um, we look forward to further conversations with you. Sac City can be a leader in this regard and, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate it. I haven't had a chance to respond to the invitation to participate, but I will definitely be there. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Irian. I recently got into a fight with a classmate at school. This resulted in getting a suspension from school and a citation from the police. Ref reflecting on the situation, the problem was more of a misunderstanding in which could have been resolved if we talked to a mentor or counselor. I feel like the police should have not been involved, especially because I'm a minor. When the police was involved, I asked for an adult before signing any paperwork, but they strictly refused and forced me to sign a, the citation. Please give this off our records. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jorge Chavez, and uh, I go to Luther Burbank High School. I recently got into a fight with uh, one of my peers at school over some rumors that happened at a party. Uh, I admit it was my fault for uh, believing the rumors and starting like kind of the problem. Uh, also, something I should have done better is uh, ask the person I fought to clarify what happened and uh, therefore, the police got involved and they uh, give, gave us a citation or a ticket. And um, uh, I believe that they shouldn't have done that because they already uh, gave us a, sus a suspension. And uh, I, also, I feel like how, uh, the school should uh, remove the police because uh, after the fight, the mentors um, help more than the police. And... Uh, yeah, I think because we already squashed the beef and I don't think the ticket was necessary. Uh, I think an alternative option would be to help like do community service or just uh, simply take the charges off of me. Um, also, the police, like they made me sign this ticket knowing I'm a minor and they didn't even notify my parents about it until like two hours later. Uh, we could, so I, I'm sorry, we're, we're running over time, but I do want to make sure that we can um, at least sit down with you and better understand your concerns. So our board special assistant has stepped out. I will ask our communications director, Alex Barrios, to take your contact information, and we can follow up and sit down with you to see if we can help. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jose Cervantes Torres, and I'm a ninth grader, and I go to Luther Birmingham High School. I didn't really get into a fight, but I punched Carlos for an Instagram comment. The same day, my friend fought his friend, and I, I was just thinking about it, what he told me, and I got heated, and I went up to him and punched him. Also, Carlos and I got a citation. It wasn't his fault to get it, even though I made a bad decision. I... I don't think citations are the solution. We actually sat down with our mentor and talked it out. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carlos Rodriguez. I am in the ninth grade and I attend Luther Burbank High School. And in the situation that I'm in, it all, it all started because I, uh, un, I undoubtedly sent messages um, that I didn't know that could be misunderstood. I originally sent them as a joke um, from a social media account, but it got misunderstood and it turned into physical abuse in which I got abused. And this problem was could have been easily resolved by just simply talking it out or just talking to a mentor, but the police officers from our school didn't just think, didn't think of that and instead they gave us a citation or a ticket and now we have to go to court. I don't think that this should be. A, I don't think that this should be the the solution because we're just minors and we got a ticket for something that is meant for criminals and we didn't even do nothing that bad. So, my question is, now that we are reflected upon ourselves, um, what can we basically do to take off this ticket off of our records and not have to go to court as a second consequence? So we were unaware of this situation, but we are going to get your contact information and also speak with the school resource officer. So please um, step aside with Alex and make sure we get all of that so we can follow up. And thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Carlos Rodríguez. Soy el papá de Carlos noches. Rodríguez. Uh, vengo aquí porque no estoy de acuerdo con el, de la forma que se le trató a, a los muchachos. El problema lo pudieron haber solucionado el, la escuela, el director, con el director se habló. Eh, digo que él ya sabía del problema, pero nunca pudo hacer nada. Entonces, yo pienso que está mal todo eso. Pudieron haberlo arreglado y no arreglarlo la policía con un ticket, uh -huh. porque no son criminales, son muchachos de 14, uh -huh. 15 años. Creo que no está bien. Good evening, um, this is Carlos Rodriguez, a parent of one of the uh, students. He considered that uh, the uh, students weren't treated fairly uh, for the, by the law, and um, they think that 
instead of uh, giving them a ticket, they should contact the parents first, in the first place. Thank you. So we are going to have you stay, if you don't mind, so that we can have you speak with the SRO and we can hopefully help with this situation. Buenas noches, este, soy el abuelo de Jorge Chavilara y estoy también en desacuerdo en la forma como se manejaron las cosas cuando un, una indisciplina escolar se maneja con la policía y se le da un ticket a los, a los, a los niños, se les trata como, uno crimin como criminales. Otra de las cosas, el, el, como dijo el papá del, del muchacho anterior, el, el principal tenía conocimiento de ese tipo de problemas y nunca hicieron nada. O sea, dejaron que las cosas pasaran como pasaron y ahora el, el castigo que se les da los mandan una semana a descansar sin tareas y sin nada. Y eso se me hace muy, muy este, en lugar de castigarlos, los, los premiaron. Pero sí estoy en desacuerdo con el ticket que les dieron porque son niños, no son delincuentes. Sí. Perdón. Gracias. Benjamín Lara Pineda. ¿Y quién es su... Soy abuelo de Jorge. Benjamin Lara Pineda, grandfather of Jorge, is also in disagreement of the way the students were treated uh, directly by the law, and uh, the principal had knowledge about the incident that was uh, going on, and um, he, uh, I'll, I'll say, he disagreed that the students were directed uh, um, to the law, in this case, the, the police, uh, instead of um, communicate with the parents uh, before. Uh, Thank you. Do we have any other items on this particular matter? Okay. Um, if you could combine your time when you come up, um, we are going to have you step aside and we're going to work to try and resolve this and have follow-up directly following the meeting. Buenas tardes. Este, mi nombre es Jorge Salazar, padrastro de Irán Salazar. Este, solamente que la señora, la señorita oficial Joseph, número 361, se portó muy ruda con nosotros en la escuela. Uh, la señorita, no sé qué número traiga, el, el 1107, ella tiene un mes de experiencia en la policía. No creo que esté de acuerdo de que la hayan mandado a, a un, a con los niños por la razón de que no tiene experiencia. Uh, no supo qué hacer, el, el ticket se los dio injustamente. Ellos no tienen ninguna clase de récord ni en la escuela ni afuera tampoco. Lo que estamos pidiendo es de que le quiten los tickets a los niños del récord de ellos. Uh, el sargento Brown también este, no se portó muy, muy buena gente con, conmigo porque yo hablé con él. Y solamente lo que quiero es que les quiten a todos los tickets, no nomás a una persona, a todos los niños, porque ellos no son, solamente fue un malentendido. Es todo. Gracias. Thank you. Jorge Salazar, este father of Irán Salazar, is uh, also uh, comment about the unfair uh, treatment um, by the police towards the students, and he is mentioned that um, the officer, ¿cómo se llama el oficial? Officer Joseph. Uh, has a very limited experience with the students, and also he is requesting to remove the uh, tickets from the student's record. Yes, yes, thank you, we've heard that. Hi, my name is Fatima Riaga, and I go to Luther Burbank High School. I will be graduating the 15th. Going to Luther Burbank High School is already difficult because there is a stereotype that the students are not well behaved, but that's just a stereotype. Many students are working hard for their education. This is a situation where emotions got in the way of that. There, there was a miscommunication, and they shouldn't be giving a citation because it was unnecessary. They are young boys. Their brains haven't fully developed yet. The brain isn't fully developed until the age 25. Luther Burbank offers lots of help, like counseling, peer mentors, and actual mentors. They have, they have the help they deserve to learn. And they have the help, 
they have the help they deserve to learn from their mistakes and not be criminalized. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'll make it brief. Alma Lopez, I'm a parent advisor at Luther Brunk High School and also a mentor and advisor with Brown Issues. And so um, I just want to point out that when I learned about the fight, I was really surprised just because the student, I've worked with the students previously. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard about the details and um, the reasons and also that fact that they had a, a citation when they had asked for an adult and they were still given a citation, I feel like their rights as students has been violated. Um, but it's not the first time that I question that practice in terms of the citations, but also um, parent notification. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't believe that's the right practice. I believe it's a very bad practice that's harming our students. And I really believe that school staff should be the ones administering any um, school discipline um, and that we should be looking at non-punitive measures. Um, I like to look at the data as to like what is the positive effects of SROs on our campus. I did request and looked for the, um, the MOU of um, the SROs on our campus. It took me a long time. Nathaniel sent it to me yesterday. I appreciate it. And I think this should be more made public. It was really difficult to find the guidelines. And I think we should definitely look over this contract. But it's, it's harming more our students and it's helping them. Thank you, Thank you, Alma. A board member, Mai Vang, is out this evening. She had a family illness. But we'll make sure that we also bring this, attention, this issue to her attention. Thank you. We have one more speaker, Melissa Tell. Good evening, Melissa. Good evening, board members. My name is Melissa Tell, and I am a parent from McClatchy High School student who's interested in German 4. He's feeling the need to continue with his German. He wants to become part of the worldwide getting to know everyone and communicating and understanding how economy works. We've also had the privilege this year of having a student from Germany live with us for a year. So it's instilled in my son this desire to continue learning and continue practicing, and he's looked into going to college in Germany. And if he's taken away the opportunity of that German 4 class, it, it's really going to hinder a lot of students. We were told that it was offered at a junior college. It's offered at ARC, which that with no transportation is very difficult to get to. He also does track and cross country after school, so the times wouldn't work with him as worth many of the students in the German class are also on track and cross country. Thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time to come speak with us tonight. That ends our public comments. Item 9.0, board workshop, strategic plan, and other initiatives. 9.1, the graduation task force update, which will be presented tonight by Dr. Iris Taylor and Vincent Harris. Good evening, Board President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, and members of the board. My name is Iris Taylor. I'm the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined tonight by Vincent Harris, our Chief Improvement and Accountability Officer, and Daryl White, a member of the Black Parallel School Board, who served on the Graduation Task Force. Um, we are here to share an update with you on the work of the Graduation Task Force that's been com completed since we presented to you in December this school year. So tonight, we'll provide an update on the work since our last presentation, and we'll share the framework used to evaluate the graduation task force recommendations and provide you with a summary of the evaluation's findings. And we'll also update you on budget considerations and then highlight um, the work that has been done in the spring of this school year. So we want to share this picture with you. Um, it's essentially the committee at work. And this is a very special picture. You may recognize some faces here um, because this was our last meeting where we invited members of the LCAP PAC to join the graduation task force so that we could share the recommendations and um, re just take it through another level of review and to receive feedback. The graduation task force um, work was commissioned by Superintendent Aguilar in the fall of 2017 out of data showing that our graduation rates were at best flat and achievement gaps persisted. 
Um, it was out of recognition that the inequitable outcomes produced were because the system was designed to produce them. The graduation task force was a call to community members to assist us in designing a different system. One, um, one that supports the guiding principle that you see on this slide that calls for all students to be given an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary choices from the widest array of options. This slide, which you've seen before, um, outlines three aspects of how we're defining equity, access, and social justice. And the work of the graduation task force really centers around the second bullet, which is about looking at our practices, our traditions, our processes, and or how they are serving to disadvantage students so that they can be changed to create greater opportunity. So as a reminder, the graduation task force was comprised of a, of a wide range of mostly community members, content experts, and district staff. Um, and their charge was to provide guidance to the superintendent and to the board regarding best practices for accelerating student graduation. The focus was on students who were traditionally underserved or underperforming in terms of graduation. And this is just simply a list of um, the range of folks who served on the committee. And we, again, just want to give our heartfelt thanks to them. They poured in and gave countless hours of their time to serve on this committee. Um, initially, that was going to end in December, but actually continued over the course of the school year. We also want to thank our facilitators, who I like to jokingly say have failed at um, retirement because, again, <laughs> Dr. Ellerby and Paula Hansel treated this like a full-time job. <laughs> okay, so Darryl, um, Mr. White's going to share with you just a little bit of the sessions and what occurred. Appreciate that. Firstly, I want to say uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Evening, but I'm not going to go White. through that because I know we need to make up some time, right? It's been a long <laughs> night. This was a great opportunity for me to be involved in, in this task force. I really believe in the idea, and I really appreciated the words of uh, Russell Rumberger from UC Santa Barbara when he set the tone for our work. He talked about the high school experience was the biggest predictor of high school success, I mean of life success. Mm -hmm. That, to me, uh, was important because it, in fact, did take, you know, set the tone. When you bring a group of people who have such different backgrounds and you have conversations about very specific topics, it can be very difficult because people are at so many different points of the continuum in terms of their understanding of, of whatever the topic is. So early on, it was decided within the group and by our facilitators that we need to make sure that we bring up the skill set of the people who are involved in this task force. And in doing that, a whole lot of topics were identified that were important to our work. And from September 20th to May 29th, about 18 meetings. Some of the highlights of some of those meetings, M Melissa Bordeaux and Sarah Wynn did a presentation on student voices about work that they had individually uh, completed in terms of talking to fellow students about what it is that they need. And too often, we as adults don't ask students anything. But there's so much information that these students have that allowed us to really take a deep, deep look at some of the work we were doing. I did a presentation on African-American uh, students, and basically that presentation talked about deficit models in terms of trying to provide supports for, for students. And I added a lot of historical stuff, take going all the way back to slavery in terms of getting people to understand why that deficit model still exists today. And why I bring that up to you is because after the presentation was over, someone that I didn't know came up to me and whispered in my ear, Thank you, I really appreciate those comments. Because I res whatever I said, I resonated. And, and that's what we talk about when we talk about culturally responsive instruction, is that we, we, we have those conversations, they're 
with, with not only students, but with each other, and hopefully something that is said resonates. Um, we had uh, Dr. Flojeron Kofer, Director of State Policy and Research. He talked about um, homelessness and foster youth, which I thought was very important for our work in terms of providing some guidance. He again talked about that deficit model. We have to really have a conversation to talk about what that looks like. And probably the key to all of this, this training for us was by Judy White, uh, uh, the county superintendent, and Paul of uh, Riverside, and Dr. Paul Gothold, county superintendent of San Diego. They talked about their experiences and their school districts and the kinds of change that they, that they brought. And when you look at uh, uh, Dr. Judy White, she actually had a plan for African-American achievement for the whole district, which I thought was really, really insightful and interesting. So those are uh, some of the comments that I add to this whole discussion. Thank you, Mr. White, and thank you for your participation in the task force. So um, as a result of the committee's work, some key themes have come up. Um, and some key areas for improvement, one being around this opt-out, a sentiment opt-out culture, um, the degree to which sites have, um, there's quite a bit of account autonomy with low accountability. Other factors being teach leadership turnover, um, things that begin but don't continue, false, uh, i.e. false starts. Um, other areas for improvement were the need to maintain focus and um, maintain the course, to prioritize, and large, a large thing that came up was around the need to assess impact. Um, too many initiatives that are going unassessed. And then being balanced and realistic about what we can tackle. There seems to be a lot that needs to be tackled, but what we can tackle given um, the district's limited resources. So themes, build consistent structures and routines. Um, so that there's a sense of coherence within the system, the need to create monitors so that we inspect what we expect, um, it continuously assessing what works and what, what does not work to determine whether or not programs and practices should continue, and then the need to share responsibility widely across the organization for student outcomes. And then finally, professional learning came up repeatedly. Um, however, but there was a call for professional learning that was accompanied by both accountability as well as support. Good evening again, Board President Ryan, Board Member Superintendent Aguilar. Um, continuing on, in terms of how we then took the recommendations of the task force, we then had a cross-department team within the district uh, spent extensive time actually using a, a nationally recognized uh, evaluation rubric, if you will, called a hexagon tool, to really take the recommendations and, and evaluate them across um, some research-based uh, criteria to, to validate which ones uh, made the most sense to implement uh, sooner, uh, which ones were most viable for increasing graduation rates. And so you can see here, um, we took a tool that's used by other organizations. Um, what's really important to recognize is that all the recommendations spoke to some type of moral imperative. And so the trade-off here wasn't so much, is a recommendation good or bad? It really came down to, does the research show, does it accelerate graduation rates? Mm -hmm. This just gives you a sense of the, the teams within the district that met for almost a, a three-month period uh, going through the recommendations because the task force really did have a, a robust set of uh, recommendations for us to evaluate. All that work really allowed us, again, to, to wrestle with the uh, equity and access social justice theory of change, looking at the intersection uh, of the four tenets and how they come together. And, of course, those recommendations that we think are, are most viable are ones that really touch all the tenets. This speaks specifically to the notion of building the monitoring system that the task force called out as being really important. And so you've seen uh, through the course of the school year, we've talked about our elements and sub-elements, uh, specifically as we look at graduation, recognizing how important it is to keep students on track, moving students who are off track, the subject borderline or to on track status, and then of course looking at our overall graduation rate, and of course looking very closely at A through G completion as well. This just gives you the frame of the overall uh, framework uh, you know, obviously due to time tonight, we won't talk about all the quadrants, but really they break into the things that, that I think most folks would agree are reasonable, right? The, the, the need for uh, the intervention, the, the fit in our context of the district work, 
uh, resource availability, and then and really um, the capacity to implement was really important to us. And then it just gives you a sound snapshot of some of the actual evaluation questions we use. And again, just you know, use this to emphasize all the recommendations spoke to a moral imperative, but our focus was on how does the recommendation move graduation outcomes. And so that really became um, the, the criteria that we really used in trying to uh, come up with an evaluative framework. Uh, so we, we've got the color schema here that we use, and we looked at the recommendations in the context of really four quadrants, high impact, low cost, uh, high impact, high cost, uh, low impact, low cost, and then low impact, high cost. And so as we tried to you know, make sense and meaning of the recommendations so that we could take action, obviously the greens are really where we put a lot of our focus to say, let's, let's get as many of those recommendations to green as possible. Recognizing those in yellow uh, speak to the fact that there may be low costs, but also are low impact, so are ones that we're, we'll think about. And then the ones in red are probably ones we'll, we'll wrestle with in terms of a longevity perspective. And so these are just verbal claims of the recommendations that fit each of the quadrants. Um, and so you can see, you know, certainly in the greens, there, there are things that were tied closely to research in terms of where we're able to look at third party research. They really validated that they impacted graduation. Again, there are good ideas both in the yellow and red quadrants. It's just the research didn't necessarily tie as explicitly that these types of things move graduation rates. But we definitely know that those were all very good ideas from the task force. The other document you have with us correspondingly tonight actually gives you a summary of the recommendations from our fall work. And so this just gives you kind of a summary scheme of, again, the same four quadrants, but now you have the recommendations broken out um, by number. So again, this is meant to just give you the, the summary of where all the recommendations landed. A lot of great work done by the task force, and we tried as a district staff to honor that. This gives you a snapshot of working with our budget team um, to try and bring to life the, the dollar impact of the recommendations. And so uh, if I could just take you to the bottom of the, of the sheet, um, it just gives you kind of a quick summary of things that were already budgeted. I think a really important theme from the task force is they felt the district was actually doing things, and so it came down to a notion of doing things well, and that's where the previously budgeted really uh, is important to recognize. Increased amounts or where the task force called out areas where, you know, as we looked at our district work, um, we could actually do more, if you will. And then finally, the new budget item really speaks to, to work um, that, that was uh, proposed by the task force that actually synergistically ties to some of our district work. Summer school probably is the best example, where if you remember the December recommendations, the task force called out the importance of summer school, and of course that work is, is currently underway right now. So just in terms of wrapping up this presentation, I uh, will speak to the fact that you know, we've got the spring recommendations, thanks to the task force's work. Um, that's another artifact you have with you as well. Well, I'll just point out with the spring recommendations, they're actually organized kind of in, a, in, in kind of a list, but this speaks to what Dr. Taylor mentioned earlier about the important way that we've used our springtime to really talk about the focus groups um, that the task force called out in the fall. And so you'll see that we have like a, a rudimentary matrix. And then equally important, because of our time with the LCAP pack, we actually had an opportunity to think about how do our recommendations tie back to the broad goals of the LCAP as well. Uh, and then we'll be spending time using this as a template to think about our work going forward next year as we look at the SPSA and LCAP, looking at the integration of those recommendations as appropriate, as, as frankly non-negotiables. Again, coming back to this notion of recognizing, as the task force called out, an opt-out element, particularly in terms of professional learning, we, we, we need to come up with uh, strategic and important non-negotiables. Uh, and then finally, um, we recognize the part of the accountability is actually an ongoing cycle of review. And so um, we're looking to have uh, board presentations as updates to the task force's work and then actually reconvening the task force as basically our accountable community as appropriate to review the presentations in advance. And so with that, I'll end the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Do we have public comments on this item? Yes, we have <clears throat> four public comments. Uh, if you could line up in order. Renee Webster Hawkins, Angel Garcia, Alex Visaya and Liz Guillen. Good evening, President, Superintendent, members of the board. I'm here as a parent in the district and also a mem as a member of the Matsuyama site, uh, School Site uh, Council Planning Committee. Um, I'm very glad to see that the workshops and efforts to include special education elements and services oh, are sorry, in the plan and have been brought forward as the plan has been evolving. 
And, and keeping in mind that it's really important that in order to increase the graduation rate of special education students, we need to start at the earliest years of their educational tenure. It requires evidence-based instruction and teaching methodology in every school, in every class, not just the inclusive practices schools. It requires um, assistive technology when appropriate to facilitate students to be able to access their grade level curriculum. And it also requires empowerment of all students and authentic acceptance by, of them by all staff and classmates. And yes, I'm glad to see very much the proactive transition element as, as these students also need special support so that they can access the career and college opportunities of their choice. I do look forward to further detail as this plan evolves um, to better understand how these elements will be programmed, staffed, and implemented. In particular, without more detail about the district's multi-tiered system of supports, it's hard as an onlooker to look at the, the budget, highlight, and appreciate what is this going to look like inside the classroom for students with various disabilities. Additionally, with, with such a large portion of the $12 million budget being allocated to supplementing the six inclusive practice schools, um, questions include what kinds of teachers are going to be hired and trained for those schools? Uh, what methodologies will those teachers be able to teach with fidelity in? And will those uh, practices and things that we learn be replicable to all the other schools that don't, uh, aren't formally designated as inclusive practice schools? And then more generally, how will both the general education and students with disability students in elementary schools such as Matsuyama, a K through six with one special day class, directly benefit from this entire plan and investments in this initiative? Thank you. I look forward to further uh, detail and, and working with you on that. Thank you. Good evening, board, uh, board uh, president Jesse and superintendent and uh, distinguished board members. Um, I first want to say that um, I was honored to be selected to serve on the task force. Um, I want to thank the district for not stopping the task force in December and continuing on to the spring. It was really important that we um, had um, more in-depth conversations. Um, I, I, do, I did want to um, talk about kind of how the graduation task force recommendations were going to be um, not only um, uh, not only figured out which ones are going to be implemented, but how they're going to be implemented and how they are tied to the LCAP cap and not only the LCAP, but the SIPSAs. Mm -hmm. The SIPSAs really tell us at the school site how whatever initiatives we're, we're um, saying that we're going to engage in are being implemented at the school. Um, uh, there were a variety of themes that I noticed as a, a task force member. One was um, being trauma-informed. The group really believed in being a trauma-informed district. We talked about it not just for students with disabilities, but our African-American students, our English language learners, our other populations that are disenfranchised. Um, and so I really urged the district as part of their MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports, to implement a trauma-informed um, practices for, or from policy to practice. Um, the other thing that was a theme was accountability. Um, we want, members want accountability. We want to know what's working and what's not working. Um, the third theme that I noticed uh, was following through. Um, so in, anything that's being implemented, we want it um, to be specific and measurable and then actually measure it and use it. Um, and one of the ways that the task force was able to think about what works was by um, utilizing experts outside of the district. For students with disabilities, we utilize Sue Sawyer, who does a lot of research and studies on transition age youth with disabilities and evidence-based practices. And I want to make sure that those are implemented in our district. What is working? Let's, let's use what is working. And lastly, um, I just want to say that we need options, graduation and post-secondary options for all students. Um, and as a parent of a student with disability and other students in this district, I want accountability now. Thank you, Angel. Mr. Visaya. Good evening. Uh, distinguished board of trustees, cabinet, and staff present.
President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, good evening. Let me go straight to, to the point. Can I have the overhead, please? I can see it. It says putting children first, even though it's Thank not you. coming up on the, the reason why board. I want to put that up, it's the logo of the district. Let's put a face on it rather than just words. Putting children first is what it should be to move forward on this task force. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Visaya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm John Perryman, who's been recently looking at budget issues. Most of tonight, I'm going to be criticizing the budget plan. I was pleasantly surprised when I read this part of the budget plan. I strongly agree with several elements in it, and generally probably agree it's pretty arguable for all of it. There is an issue with the inappropriate use of Title I money for things that are not direct services to students. Technically, it's federal government might allow it, but state law still doesn't allow it. That's an issue. Honestly, on that technical issue, I probably would have stayed home and nursed my cold. But it's part of a larger pattern of misuse of targeted money that afflicts this budget plan. Anyway, I like what I see. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Guillen. Good evening. Uh, Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Um, first of all, I want to say how proud I was to be uh, asked to uh, join and contribute to the work of the task force. Um, what I thought, uh, the process was incredible, and it really demonstrated to me that this district has the capacity and does know how uh, to develop a plan, what I was most impressed by was how integrated the process was in terms of information from various parts of the district and from outside of the district where graduation task force members asked. Um, when the LCAP members were brought in, um, they expressed a lot of surprise because after their time working with the district for what, two years in some cases, maybe three, their approach had been completely different, which isn't a bad thing, but uh, it, did, it did lift up some of the concerns that I have. For the LCAP to be uh, uh, planning to spend over $400 million um, and addressing some really uh, persistent issues that are similar to the graduation issue here, um, I really think that um, the district should consider making the same kind of investment in how it approaches addressing those same problems and looking at how funds are spent. So, for example, the monitoring that uh, some of the task force members have raised, I think, is really, really critical, and especially as uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the LCAP comes to its... Um, third year or final year of its three-year plan. Overall, I think this is a really wonderful process, and I think the recommendations are very well taken. Uh, and I'm sorry that um, that process isn't also used for LCAP. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gian. Good evening. My name is Lamaya Coleman. Um, I have a child at William Land, I'm a sub in the district, and I'm a member of Sacramento Area Congregations Together. Um, so I was not part of the graduation task force, although SAC Act was, and just as I look over the estimated cost of new and proposed recommendations, a couple of things kind of strike me. Um, we've been really lifting up the importance of school climate, behavior supports, uh, and social emotional learning um, and I don't see a lot here that is addressing that under attendance it's blank although I do note that the multi-tiered system of support um, the attendance grant I'm assuming addresses part of part of that I'm just I'm not knowledgeable enough to know how 
how it addresses it. Um, and under behavior, I noticed that there's only one thing. The, another thing I noticed is that a lot of the, the, under the status, it mentions that most of them are previously budgeted. Um, and so I'm wondering if they are previously budgeted and previously in, implemented, and the people on the task force were saying, there's not, there, it's not working, there's a need, maybe we can do this. And it's already been being done, but there's still the need. There's some sort of a disconnect, at least at the parent or community level. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to note that. Um, and then the other thing is that as much as there's a, there's a tension between, uh, between wanting to put things towards programming, there's also the real need to make sure things work. And, so, and I know it's expensive, Absolutely. but the monitoring the data collection is, is very important so that things can really be looked at in a, in a solid way as opposed to just like, well, I think it works or I don't think it works. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. We have no further public comments at this time. At this time, we'll take comments and questions from board members. Board member Minnick. Thank you, President Ryan. Um, I just have a few. I don't have any questions, but I do have just a, a few comments. I was really um, pleased to be part of this, uh, this task force. I thought we had uh, quite a amazing array of uh, folks at the table, um, uh, both experts in their field and, you know, parents like me and, uh, you know, that, that really uh, just wanted to, to delve deep into these issues and, and I thought we had a really great group and I really appreciate all the work that all the staff put into uh, ensuring we had the support uh, that we needed to have those thoughtful conversations, to have the uh, support in terms of uh, those uh, speakers and, and other professionals come in to kind of help support that work. So I really appreciate it. Um, I, I also really appreciated from my colleagues on the on the task force the uh, ability to kind of separate from all the things that we tend to do. Uh, when we think about what we want to achieve, which is making up excuses, well, you know, we can't do that because it's too expensive, or we can't do that because it's never been done before, or, or we can't, we have, uh, that we can't do this because it has to be negotiated into staff contracts or whatever, um, that we put kind of aside all those self-imposed barriers uh, to really think big, uh, to really talk about, you know, what do we need? And we can think about how we're going to get there later, but first let's think about what, what we really need for these kids. And I really appreciated how folks really were able to kind of focus on that. And we came up with some really big ideas and a lot of them because I don't, what is it, like 70 <laughs> something recommendations or something like that. Um, but I really appreciated that. Um, and to kind of like Renee's uh, point where she was kind of getting a little bit more into the into the weeds, you know, we, we stayed kind of up at the, you know, 30,000 foot level to look at like kind of what do we need big picture across the district. Um, and now is, is going to be that time to look into those weeds and, and you're kind of moving us into that. So I, I appreciate that. Um, the other piece that I just want to say is that I, um, I feel like this process and this system of, of going, delving deep into these, uh, um, these concerns, in this case, graduation, um, really worked. Like, it really worked for me, and not just because I took a lot of the information and then used it in my, uh, you know, other um, parts of my life, um, but just I feel like we really got to the root of a lot of great stuff. Um, and so my kind of, um, my hope moving forward for the, the superintendent and, and the board and, and staff is to really think about, and I know it's time consuming and it's staff heavy, um, but if, if this system is working for us, this is really the um, process that we need to use to delve deep into some of those other things that um, we have struggled with, whether it's um, the disparities for our African American students, whether it's our uh, disparities for our special ed students. Um, this process worked. Um, and of course, we haven't implemented you know, uh, all of our recommendations yet, um, but I see this as such a great way of us to really uh, to 
get to the root of our, our concerns and how to address them, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'm hoping that we can kind of continuously have some, uh, some uh, task forces such as this to address kind of our, our future um, uh, issues to, to discuss once, once we've kind of wrapped this up. But thank you for all your help and everybody who participated. Thank you, Board Member Minnick, and thank you for your service on the Graduation Task Force. Um, I had a few comments and observations and then a, a question for the staff. You know, I really want to begin by thanking the task force members who are here tonight for tirelessly giving of your time to participate in a fairly extensive process that really culminated over the course of the year. I know that we were asking you to be thought partners and to really do a deep dive into issue content in a way that for some was more intense than we had originally even anticipated. I want to thank the staff for finding a remarkable caliber of presenters across the state. You know, some of the best at what they do on the issues that were presented. I heard comments from uh, individuals on the outside that in some cases they wondered if we realized how fortunate we were to get these statewide leaders to spend time with us to share their thinking and suggestions for implementing some of the best practices that they had put in place in other areas of the state in Sac City unified. I do want to, to call out, um, and this was alluded to by Ms. Guillen, that this process worked for a variety of reasons and that we should be looking at its potential applications for the LCAP. I know that the one night that we combined our LCAP Parent Advisory Committee with the Graduation Task Force, what they took away was rich and meaningful. And so to the extent that we can figure out a way of contextualizing these sometimes hairy, audacious budget conversations with content experts and a process similar to that that we employ with the graduation task force, I think it would be incredibly helpful. I do have some questions around how we went from 50 plus recommendations at the last presentation that we had on the graduation task force to this list of suggested uh, proposed recommendations. Is this the culmination of what was prioritized by the task force, or is this just a sampling based on issue areas costed out? So to a large degree to your question, Board President Ryan, we, we kind of had the task force in two halves. And so what you saw costed out was really the fall work because it took us some extensive time um, to really do the, the research-based practices, to do the evaluation. The other list actually reflects the work of the task force this spring. Um, and so we actually need to spend the same quality time as staff uh, going through and, rev and, 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 and revising. I will say this to your question. As the task force left the fall, and this gets to the commitment that they made, they realized we still had gaps in terms of specifically talking about student groups, mm -hmm. um, really tying back to conversations that we've had here in our board meetings, particularly African-American students, special education students, foster youth. And so the task force actually said we need to spend more time not just looking at graduation rate increase, mm -hmm. but look at it for historically underrepresented groups. And so that second list really represents our deeper dive saying, and, and, and to your question, there's going to be some process in which we'll try to evaluate some of the duplicative nature of some of those spring recommendations to the fall. Okay. But, but what you'll get in the fall will be a, a new restored list of the spring results um, of our evaluation through the rubric. And so there will be some additional uh, set of recommendations that we'll bring you in the fall saying now we have a new set of recommendations that we need to integrate within um, our district work. So thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that you heard the, the concern from the board that we needed to concentrate on our struggling student subgroups, in particular our African American population as well as our special education population. And I see in the topics discussed that there was a deeper dive on both of those. I do want to make sure that, that we point out that these are proposed recommendations, not adopted recommendations. And I I think that that's an important point because of the 12 million uh, 
close to $700,000 that would be allocated. $5.7 million is new money. And I think we're going to hear some sobering budget projections tonight. I think we're recognizing that while there's a great deal of need and we have to go deeper, I'm excited to see the potential for a $1.7 million investment in special education and in more inclusive practices at school sites. But we are going to have to be able to find the resources to do that. And I do want to make sure as we assess the viability, and I saw that language throughout what you shared, that the viability is not just the financial viability. When we talked about what was high impact, low cost, I also want us to really look at how are we reaching um, a number of students who would not necessarily be successful without these interventions. And so that same level of intentionality for struggling student populations and also for scalability of the work since we have such a high need district, I believe needs to be part of the next presentation that you bring before us. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. We're moving on to item 10.0, public hearing. Item 10.1. Got a uh, cell phone that was left at the... <laughs> he told no, me I need mine. to now. He said I need to hit the gavel after every... 2018-2019 annual service plan and annual budget plan for special education, which will be presented by Iris Taylor and Becky Bryant. Hey, good evening, Board President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, and members of the board. I'm Iris Taylor, our Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined tonight by Becky Bryant, our Special Education and SELPA Director, um, to share with you the Special Education Local Plan Area Service and Budget Plan. California Education Code requires that the Board of Education adopts the SELPA Annual Service and Budget Plan no later than June 30th of the 2018-19 school year. This plan includes a description of each of the services available and certifies that a continuum of services um, are available for students to address their specialized needs. It does require public hearing and then prior to adoption, um, upon adoption, the state releases the funding for services for the upcoming school year. So Becky Bryant will share with you some more details about what's included in the plan. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Angular. Uh, the plan comes in two parts. It's the service plan and the budget plan. This slide represents um, part of the service plan where it describes the services that we provide. Um, either directly or through agreements with agencies such as SCOE. The state assigns a code, which is on the left hand side of the slide, and in your board packet, this you have the complete document and it's located starting on page 40 and ending on page 50. The descriptions provide the definitions of each of those codes. The next slide represents an example of the physical location of the services provided. The full documents in your packet, again, starting on page 28 and ending on page 39 for your reference. This example shows that at Rosemont High School, for example, which is a comprehensive school, the following services are provided. Uh, specialized academic instruction, speech and language, adaptive physical education, etc. This information is sub uh, in submitted to the state two times per year. And this documentation is from our uh, December submission. The annual budget plan is the second part of the plan and involves project, includes projected revenues and expenses for the following year, or the coming year. Um, a four-year comparison shows that the projected revenue has increased yearly. However, that increase is mostly due to a contribution from the district's LCFF funds as the state and federal allocations um, to provide the services have never um, risen to the level um, in the same uh, trajectory as the LCFF. So for next year, the district contribution is expected to be about $73 million, including transportation. 
This slide represents how the dollars flow um, to us for our use. Um, most all of them are restricted dollars. Of note, the federal and state dollars are only funding about a third of what it costs to provide services to our students. The remainder of the funds come from some smaller grants that we have in LCFF. This slide is our expected expenditures for 2018-19. Um, it's, it's important to remember that it costs much more to educate a child with um, a disability than it, than it does to educate a child without. These are broad funding categories and they're organized in the manner that we report the expenses to the state. And as you can see, the projected expenses for the 2018-19 school year will be over $110 million. Our next steps, we ask that you conduct the public hearing this evening and improve, approve the annual service and budget plan at the June 21st board meeting. Additionally, and more importantly, while we ask you to take action on this compliance item, please know that the department is working closely in collaboration with other departments to draft plans for the rest of the special education audit recommendation, as was shared with you in your learning um, session a couple of weeks ago. And in doing so, we're using a theory of action to improve the following, our service delivery, department efficiency, and our student outcomes. And these plans will be completed by September 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Do we have any public comment on this item? Yes, we have three public comments. Angel Garcia, followed by John Perryman and Renee Webster Hawkins. Hi, I'm Angel Garcia. I'm part of the Coalition for Students with Disabilities. Um, I, <laughs> I um, am not very happy. Um, I feel that this presentation was thrown together. If you looked at the contextual information provided by the Graduation Task Force and other contextual information that the LCAP um, folks will provide you, it would give some kind of information to a layperson on how to apply this jargon that was just presented to us. Um, the graduation task force took time and explained how they developed their recommendations and how they put time into it. The LCAP folks will also explain how those things were done. Um, I want to say that California Ed Code requires that there be a community advisory committee. However, um, the community advisory committee was dissolved in April 2012 um, due to a lack of fiscal and logistical support. Uh, as required by law, a lack of information needed to advise, a lack of consideration of, of annual priorities, which are also required by law. Um, the CAC was not consulted regard, regard, rec regarding this plan, which makes it out of compliance. I'm going to read you Ed Code. Um, that makes me really upset because there's no CAC because folks were not consulted with throughout the year. Uh, Ed Code 56194 requires that a community advisory committee shall have the authority and fulfill the responsibilities that are defined for it in the local plan. The responsibilities shall include, but need not be limited to, all of the following. A, advising the policy and administrative entity of the special education local plan area regarding the development, amendment, and review of the local plan. The entity shall review and consider comments from the community advisory committee. B, recommending annual priorities to be addressed by the plan. C, assisting in parent education and recru recruiting parents and other volunteers who may contribute to the implementation of the plan. D, encouraging community involvement in the development and review of the local plan. E, supporting activities on behalf of individuals with ex exceptional needs. F, assisting parents, parent awareness of the importance of regular school attendance. This is not a document that needs to be rubber stamped. It is offensive that it's going to be you know, shown here with all this jargon, with no kind of input from the disability community, and then just expect a rubber stamp. I am offended as a parent of a child with disability. Thank you, Angel. Hi, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I think you're caught in a catch-22 situation. Federal and state money is not keeping up with need for special ed inclusion. 
So budget people have reached into supplemental and concentration grant money to make up the deficit. They're spending about $6 million on school psychologists and nurses, which 95% of you are, 95% of them are assigned a caseload by the special ed department. Okay, that makes sense. But the problem is the ACLU and Community Coalition sued LA Unified School District for doing exactly the same thing. And LA Unified lost, and they lost their appeal in April of 2017. So you can't use supplemental and concentration grant money to make up the deficit. Eventually, somebody's going to sue you guys too. You're caught in catch-22. Honestly, I don't have a solution. My suspicion is your general fund is over-encumbered, which means employee compensation has to be set aside. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, President, Superintendent, members of the board. I'm Renee Webster Hawkins, and I'm here as a parent in the district, a member of the Matsuyama School Site Council, and a former member of the CAC. To uh, tag on what Angel shared with you, the plan and the budget at this course level of detail simply lacks sufficient detail for any parent to appreciate what the district is planning to spend to support students with disabilities. Looking at the budget, and I'm going to go on a deep dive again, Member Minnick, one would expect to see the roll-up into the broad categories that are mandated by the form shared with you tonight and give you the detail allowing all of us to learn the planned expenditures broken down by various types of services, what is spent for students with different types of disabilities, what is spent on students with disabilities by grade, that would help us understand some of the drop-offs we're seeing with the um, other data that you've been shared in other presentations this year. What is being spent for inclusive practices, school sites? What is being spent to provide students educational and related services by outside contracts? How much is being spent to send students to outside schools? How much is being spent on professional development for our faculty? How much is being spent to defend against legal claims and the many audits and federal and state monitoring that the district is undergoing? How this budget for next year compares to actual expenditures by line item over the past two or three years? And what new expenditures are planned to tackle the deficiencies documented in the audit? What the budget does show is that every year the budget to transport students away from their neighborhoods to segregated day classes is increasing. It is up to 12 million this year, over 10 million last year, and it's more than 10% of the total budget. Only budget nerds like me may make sense of the plan before you tonight. Looking to the case miss codes, as staff indicated, the categories 340 and 350 are there to reflect when a student needs individual or small group instruction, all are part of the school day. But then if you look at the 11 pages of the detailed uh, report, only 11 schools in the entire district out of 139 campus sites apparently need these individual or small group instructions. I don't think that's right. However, it's misleading. And so it's really hard to, just even looking at that data point alone to understand what's going on in this budget and what services are being provided at any school. As a former member of the Community Advisory Committee, I'm not aware that this level of detail has ever been provided to the group that's assembled to understand that information and advise you on its view. As a parent and an advocate, I would ask that the board insist on this level of de uh, detail of reporting of past expenditures and future budgets and that it be presented annually and far enough in advance for you and the community to digest to ensure that the district's efforts to support and improve outcomes for students with disabilities are transparent and Thank accountable. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. We have one more public comment. Hi. Good evening, board. I'm Sandra Gagan, and I'm here to talk about the plan and how we talk about inclusion so much in special education, and yet this plan seems so segregated we need to see it in context with the graduation task force, with the LCAP, and the board needs, board members need to be trained in depth so that you can see how it affects the outcomes for our students and so that you can ask the right questions and see how it's integrated and affects in the graduation rates that we just talked about. 
Today I read a story about a student with Down syndrome that graduated from high school. He wasn't a student in this district, but I said shout that from the mountaintops because we need to see the potential in these students. And when you see the potential in these students, you consider them and you integrate their plans into every aspect of your school and you review the data on a regular basis and you respond accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the comments from our public tonight. Um, I, I do want to say that following our last presentation, we had a board learning session with our superintendent. He has done some intense work with the staff, and our expectations are that we will have a clear and detailed plan for this work moving forward, recognizing that this is a grave issue, an area of growth for us, for a student population that's currently being left behind. Do we have any questions or comments from board members? Okay, we don't. So moving on to item 10.2, the local control and accountability plan. Good evening, uh, again, Board President Ryan, Board Members, Superintendent Aguilar. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight uh, to present uh, to you the uh, Local Control Accountability Plan public hearing with Kathy Morrison, our uh, LCAP and SIPSA coordinator. So this uh, public hearing is, is mandated uh, by Education Code, and so as required, uh, this hearing is being held at the same meeting as the district budget hearing. You know, many times we present this slide during board meetings, and, and really the importance for it tonight is to speak about how we're looking to position the LCAP uh, really as a vehicle to help us interrupt the inequities that exist to level the playing field and ultimately implement the guiding principle with fidelity within our district. And so we've shown this graphic now several times, but, you know, it really is the aspiration of us as we think about our district work is that you know many of these things can be seen as discrete, but we know that for our students, for our community, um, the power of bringing together uh, the LCAP, our SIPSAs, and of course anchoring them within the Performance and Target Action Index, which is our internal accountability system, really is our strategic vision in terms of driving the overall budget development going forward. This just provides a rough timing uh, of everything that's needed to take place in the process. You can see we're, we're really targeting on time right now. Um, in terms of the guidance that we've gotten from um, the Sacramento County Office of Education. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Kathy Morrison to take you through a few more parts Thank of the you, presentation. Good evening, President Ryan, board members, Kathy Morrison. This is a snapshot of groups that were consulted during the spring. Meaningful stakeholder engagement is key to the successful implementation of the local control and accountability plan. In addition to the engagement of standing committees, bargaining partners, and parents, we leverage the collective voice and expertise of the LCAP Parent Advisory Committee, or LCAP PAC, and our DLAC, our District English Learner Advisory Committee. Data was a strong focus for the LCAP PAC this year. We started with the state dashboard and dove deep into the Riverside County Office of Education's alternative views. Both the, LCAP and the, both the LCAP PAC and the DLEC have provided comments on the LCAP as required by statute. The draft LCAP provided for review included additional funds received between the second interim and the May revise. It also included the new designation of funds titled uh, LCFF Supplemental Concentration English Learners. So uh, again, we remind the four goals remain the same as the previous year. These are select actions contained in goal one, the biggest investment in our LCAP with about 85% of total funds. 
As you heard in the graduation task force presentation, professional learning is a significant activity for supporting students. And our newest activity included in the LCAP is the expanded learning summer program. Goal two actions align with state priorities for basic services, school climate, and student engagement. The wraparound services provided by our student support centers, nurses, social workers, and mental health counselors are the, one of some of the most frequently mentioned comments that we hear from our stakeholders and community. These are the select actions contained in uh, goal three, parent-teacher home visits, parent education activities, and our translation and interpretation. The increased focus on data-driven data decision-making is the heart of goal four. We want the community to see the value of LCAP investments through our district's data framework. So uh, we have talked about this in the past. On the left, we show four student groups whose outcomes are not meeting the state's goals for performance and growth. And on the right, we see the state indicators for which the district uh, shows high need. I'm turn it back to Mr. Harris. Thank you. And just briefly, just again, want to reinforce how as a system we're, we're digging deeper. We just had our first uh, differentiate assistance meeting with the Sacramento County of Education, uh, County Office of Education last Friday. And so we've uh, worked with them, are now partnering with them as we dig deeper on these targeted student groups. This gives you a snapshot from our internal uh, district accountability system, which we've talked about this notion of elements back to graduation. I just want to highlight one of them, on track retention rate, just speaking to our students who are on track to graduate. Um, again, as we think about making students visible, this is a snapshot of the tools disproportionality tab. This is in all the groups, of course, that we can see for disproportionality, but we just wanted to emphasize as we think about strategic groups of students, making students visible, this gives us a sense of those students whose retention rate for graduation is less than, than, than what we'd expect. Because when you look across, just really briefly, if you see a, 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 in the far right, if you see a one or above, that student is at its percentage in student population or above. When you see less than one, as you can see in these student cases, um, they're not represented at their levels to overall student population. And then again, as we think about making students visible, beyond just student groups, we actually can make students themselves visible. And so as we think about on-track retention, this is just a snapshot of a grade 12 student where you can see in the bottom right, um, this notion of credits earned and minimum credits required. This student is on track because this student um, is earning the appropriate number of credits. And obviously, uh, for students who are not on track, we would see you know, a, def a deficit between those two uh, boxes. So this is just another example of how we're using, um, as, as uh, Ms. Morrison mentioned, this notion of investing in our databases so that we can make students visible and, and respond uh, to issues in real time. With that, I'll turn it back to Kathy to wrap up. So the district has received over $70 million for next year in supplemental and concentration funds. Supplemental and concentration funds are used to increase or improve services provided to our unduplicated pupils as compared to the services provided to all students. In the subsequent draft, we will describe actions and services equal to or greater than 22.52% of those funds provided as an increase or improvement. Uh, again, this is a reminder of our um, adherence to the uh, recommendations of SCOE in terms of the timeline, and I also provided a few snapshots of our LCAP PAC hard at work. So in closing, our uh, timeline includes the adoption at our next scheduled board meeting. As part of the alignment of the LCAP SIPSA and budget, we are including our school single plans in the adoption on June 21st as well, along with the LCAP and budget. And I believe at this point I will turn it back to Board President Ryan to conduct the pub public hearing. Thank you. It looks like Alex has stepped away. Um, Gerardo, do you have the public comment cards? 
Do we have public comment on this item? Yes. We have um, over 10 comments. Okay. Um, if we can keep the public comments to one minute per public commenter so that we can make it through the remainder of our agenda. Thank you. Um, speaker number one is uh, Luisa Menchaca. Um, number Renette Wester. Angel Garcia. Daryl White. Tony Tinker. Sherilyn. Carl Pinkston. Angela Ash. John Perryman, Karen Sweat, and Liz Guillen. Thank you. Okay, evening. thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Superintendent and Board Members. My name is Luisa Menchaca, and I'm the President of the local uh, LULAC organization. Uh, that's the League of United Latin American Citizens. And we are a civic organization that advocates for uh, civil rights, and among those Issues, of course, would be educational achievement. I'm here today with uh, Dr. Dwayne Campbell, our Education Committee Chair, and other LULAC members who have been working with district staff to, to urge actions that will benefit English learners. Details are included in the letter that we submitted to you. Um, I'm addressing the LCAP update, Action 10, pages 104 to 106. In the few seconds of our first recommendations that is that you add instructional time in English through direct instruction in small groups by adding, adding 10 bilingual skilled residential resource teachers. Our second recommendation is that in addition to tracking English learners. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We only have three board members, I think. Oh, we have lost quorum. I'm sorry, I'm going to have you hold for one okay. second. Um, if I can please have our board member Minnick and or Christina Pritchett come back. Okay, we, we have quorum again. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I'll try to thank you, Mr. Barron. Okay. So the second is recommendation that in addition to tracking English learner funds, the district actually ensure that the authorized funds now reaching $6 million are used primarily for those students. Uh, we do appreciate that it looks like you've added code 0009 to actually track those funds, and so we hope to see improvement in the future. We'll come back to give you. And funds. thank you for your detailed letter. We appreciate it. Good evening, President, Superintendent, members of the board. I'm Renee Webster Hawkins, and I'm here as a parent and also as a member of the Matsuyama School Site Council. Um, you know, the LCAP is um, a, a monstrous undertaking every year, and, um, and I'd like to just highlight two pinpoints of light um, in that process. Um, one is to thank uh, Kathy Morrison and Tony Tinker of the Black Parallel School Board and Liz Guillen of Public Advocates. They came to uh, a site um, event at Matsuyama School um, to engage parents in how to interpret the data dashboard and what that means both for school selection as well as the formation of the LCAP and expenditures at the school site level. And, um, and you think about the number of schools and the number of parents that um, could use that information. That level of, of outreach is necessary for authentic engagement, and I applaud that they're willing to do that even in these busy times of the year. I'd also like to highlight Principal Judy Montgomery um, refusing to rest easy on uh, the relatively high number of blue and green pies that Matsuyama has um, on the data dashboard. She decided in this year's SIPSA to include specific goals and objectives to increase the ELA and math achievement scores for African American students and students with disabilities. That's how things get done at the local level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Hi, Angel Garcia, Coalition for Students with Disabilities. Um, I do want to mention that the LCAP was not able to consult with the CAC because the CAC dissolved in April and the LCAP staff wanted to meet in May. Um, also, the CAC meeting in May was canceled, um, I'm assuming by the special ed department. There was no outreach for parents to attend that meeting and provide input and connect with the LCAP folks. Um, 
this district and, and uh, the board um, needs to push the special ed department to actively search out parents to build a CAC at this point because they had no input for the LCAP. Um, and they need the CAC for input for other required um, plans and, and information that the district's having. So that's a real issue. Um, also, I want to say that the LCAP is a high-level document the SIP says are down at the ground level, which describe how it's happening directly. So it's in the weeds. And we want to ensure that members of the school site council um, are from the disability community and other groups we've heard from that are disenfranchised, African Americans, foster youth, English learners. And so moving forward, really push that school site council's uh, members are, are, are reflective of the community. Um, and that also, um, just as this is integrated into the equity access and social justice, we want um, the plans like the special ed plan to, to be integrated as well to represent students with disabilities. Thank you, Angel. Carl? I'm going to give up my time to Daryl to give a presentation on the recommendations. Okay. So. Okay. So you're going to be doing the recommendations that we received at the board okay, meeting Jason, last time around? So five. we'll combine the time. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, as I uh, talk to you, I, I actually have talked to you before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about the African American Priorities Plan. And that plan and its development brought a lot of excitement to me, and it's a joy for me to, do, to, to, to express uh, not only how we feel about it, but how we can possibly use it. But I wanted to um, take us back just a little bit in time. When we look at the data, it is clear in its explanation of how African-American students are doing in this district that they're not doing very well. When the data set focuses on high, for example, test scores, the African-American population is on the low end. When the data set focuses on low suspensions, for an example, the African-American population is always on the high end. This trend has been historical, and I've been here for 25 years. But let me take you back to 19, uh, 2009. In 2009, the Black Parallel School Board wrote a paper on the status of African-American students in the school district. We discovered a five-year trend where the achievement gap between African-American students and white and Asian students was roughly about 150 API points. We also discovered that African-American students were improving about three points per year and thus concluded that at that rate, it would take 42 years to close the gap. In 2011, we took another look, wrote a new report, and that average <laughs> amount of increase dropped to about two points per year, and we concluded that it would take 72 years to close the gap. We made a big mistake, though, in terms of how we expressed what that gap meant. And I no longer like the word gap because it gives a negative connotation to the one on the bottom. I like what they do in Canada, the researchers in Canada. They talk about a receivement gap, meaning you have students who start out and they're all over the place or at different points. And being at different points simply means they need some need to receive more and others need to receive less in terms of moving all students at the same time. In order to uh, achieve change for African-American students, we feel new systems of support, service, and assistance must be created that include specific targets. Those targets must be specific to group and name. So why an African-American priorities plan? Well, it makes it clear that the African-American community wants to be involved in the improvement process. Rather than just using language as advocacy and just talk about the problem, we now want to shoulder some of the responsibility in developing a list of priorities to change the ugly outcomes that I spoke of earlier. The African community also wants to get involved to assist the district leadership in creating new systems to improve outcomes of African-American students. We also want to provide the advocacy necessary to allow the district to integrate specific language that highlights the dilemma that our students face while naming African-American students in its LCAP priorities and related goals and objectives. If we focus our resources at the problem, we should be able to make notable gains in all the important educational outcomes. Now, how do we use it? 
for legislative policy leaders can use the plan to develop an understanding of activities that the African community will support and assist in this district's leadership. The district can also use the plan as a resource to identify specific actions that can be used as part of a multi-year plan. Grant writers can also use this information to develop programs for specific populations and create partnerships with community organizations. Principals, too, can use this plan to address concerns that relates to the African-American students on their campuses. School leadership teams, after data review, can use this plan to identify specific activities that they want to include in their school site plans as it relates to their students. Parents and community can use the plan to learn about all the services, support, and activities that could be used to improve instruction uh, and the relationships between teachers and students. They will have a point of reference when serving on school leadership committees to advocate for their children. And finally, students, after review of the plan, can identify specific activities that they can advocate for on the school campuses to help themselves. I just remember Melissa and, and Sarah when they did their research. One of the similar kinds of outcomes that I found significant was students wanted to improve relationships between teachers and students. And they thought that that by itself would take, would increase the kind of outcomes we're talking about. You've heard me say repeatedly, if we can change the outcomes for the least of us, then we can change it for all of our students. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mr. White. And I think we're having a bit of a problem with our clock right now, but we're going to reset it for the next person. And thank you. We appreciate your comments. And Mr. White, if you wouldn't mind sending out the full recommendations to the board again, I think that would be helpful. Good evening, distinguished board members, President Ryan and Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Angela Ash, and I am a parent of a fifth grade student in Sac City Unified School District and a member of my school site council. I didn't get to finish my pitch, so I'm back. Um, I want to say that uh, I am here to advocate for waiving fingerprinting fees and to uh, e receive extended uh, services um, by providing extended hours at the district office and hopefully obtaining a mobile fingerprinting services. Um, I asked uh, the district for um, information on fingerprinting waivers, and the paper that I'm showing you here shows that uh, the fees or the waiver fees were provided on a first come, first served basis, which I believe is inequitable. Um, and the majority of the fee waivers went to a school that has a very low free and reduced lunch status, 33%. Um, and a fifth of those waivers went to that school, which I find appalling. Um, so I am here to petition the board to include in their upcoming budget uh, a waiving of fingerprinting fees, extending hours, and providing mobile fingerprinting services. This would be in a, uh, according to the LCAP goals three and four, uh, seek to empower families and community by building capacity and to achieve operational excellence by being a service-focused organization. Those are uh, all, I, no, I appreciate those suggestions. And I will say that the schools that you pointed out that are more well-resourced schools that have higher level of parent involvement also probably have a better understanding of the ability to waive fees. And so we have to be more intentional in making sure at our less resource schools that we're getting the word out. I very much appreciate your comments. Absolutely. At a bare minimum, the fees should, fee waivers should be uh, by needs basis at a minimum, but Absolutely. I would advocate for greater uh, accessibility uh, to alleviate transportation issues and also to provide free fingerprinting services. We know that when parents participate, children succeed. Absolutely. Thank you for Thank your you time. Thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. Uh, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen of the board. With respect to supplemental and concentration grant money, the main issue with the process used to decide on how to spend it was that neither the survey nor the committees were given directions to treat supplemental and concentration grant money any differently than general fund money. As a result, you see things that are clearly general fund expenses charged to supplemental and concentration. Librarians, that's not an intervention, and they do not provide services to targeted students above the ratio of other students. Vice principals, I've taught in this district since 1987. 
Those have always been general fund expenses. Those are not appropriate uses for targeted money. Thank you very much. Good evening, Karen Sweat, Making Sense Work. I think the LCAP is pretty darn good. Congrats to Kathy and her team for the volume of work that they did and the quality for the most part. Um, my complaint about the LCAP is the template of which the district has no control. Primarily, page 7 is misleading. It gives the budget information. So I think it's really important for people, for the board, and for people to recognize that the dollar amounts on that page 7 aren't as good as they should be. Keep in mind that there is a child development fund, Fund 12, from which general fund is transferring, not contributing. They're transferring $2.3 million out of the general fund into um, the child development fund, and it's up and cons that's being transferred according to the LCAP. And the Child Development Fund itself has $21.9 million. There's other work being done that the LCAP really does need to consider. That's not all. Thank you, Ms. Sweat. Ms. Gian? Hi, Liz Gian with Public Advocates. Um, I appreciated um, the transparency in the LCAP around um, the um, amount of supplemental and concentration dollars that the district expects to receive. That's 71.5 million. So we're at, we're going to be at full funding next year. So that 71.5 million is the amount uh, of money that uh, the district really needs to be accountable for increasing and improving services for low-income students, English learners, and foster youth, the students that generate these funds, um, and that the services are effective in meeting their needs. So that standard is one that I was sort of obliquely referring to mm -hmm. earlier uh, in terms of monitoring and identifying whether or not the things work. Um, in my minute... I wasn't able to get to my uh, my bigger point, but um, please feel free to finish your thoughts, I'm sorry. Liz. Um, what I encourage us to do is to uh, have have us all come together, since we are all accountable together, um, to understand the different pieces of the LCAP, the different goals. Perhaps I recommend that, similar to what some of the other. Uh, presenters mentioned that there be like a road show for school site councils mm -hmm. so that everybody can understand what their piece is and they can know what it is they need to be putting their arms around to understand whether or not it's occurring, uh, why it's not working, or whether it is working. Excellent suggestion, Liz. And I'd like to ask if you and Tony, um, after June 15th, when school is over for the year, if we can use the summer months to come together and develop some plan for doing some further work at the school site level. Definitely. I'm in conversation now with Kathy about how we might be able to do some summer things with some of the parents who are less involved. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. We have no further public comment. Moving on to item 10.3, the proposed fiscal year 2018-2019 budget for all funding. Um, we're going to have a presentation tonight from Gerardo Castillo and Gloria Chung. Um, good evening, President Ryan. Superintendent Aguilar and members of the board. I'm Gerardo Castillo, Chief Business Officer, and I'm joining in this presentation by our budget director, Gloria Chan. We look forward to presenting to you tonight the current status of the 2018-19 budget. In this presentation, we will cover the key takeaways the board should be aware for the next fiscal year and a summary of the general fund revenue and expenditures. The presentation will conclude with the next steps 
for the board. <laughs> We're going to start by giving you the most important takeaways from this year's budget. First, despite the governor proposing to invest more money in K-12 education, many school districts in California are far from being on the strong financial position. This is because our expenditures are greater than our revenues. In Sacramento City Unified School District, this is the case. It's worth noting that the LCFF is now fully funded two years ahead of schedule. Therefore, we have been advised by the Department of Finance and the Governor's Office not to expect to receive increased LCA funding in the future years. We will use the rest of this presentation to go over the current financial situation, what the future looks like for our district, if we continue funding our existing programs in the next year and beyond. This slide shows our current situation for 2018-19 fiscal year. If we maintain the status quo in our budgeting, as you can see in this chart, the money that's coming in into our year is less than what's going out to pay the bills. Our revenue is $531 million, are represented by the green bar. Our expenditures, $559 million, are represented by the red bar. As you can see, the expenditures exceed our revenues by over $28.5 million. Yeah, I might use a household budget, a household budget analogy. What this slide is showing us is that the money that we are earning is not enough to pay our bills for the year. Obviously, this is a, this is a situation where our bills are bigger than our paycheck. It's not a situation we want to be if we want to consider taking on more projects. This slide shows us the number, in numbers how we got to this point. Back in 2013-14, when the LCFF took effect, we as a district were receiving more in revenues than we were paying in expenditures. Much of that had to do with one-time funds that we received late in the budget cycle, so for a few years, we were able to set aside some of the money in reserves. However, starting in 2017-18, we are now spending more than we are getting. So we are in deficit spending, and this is a trend that we are projecting for the future years if we maintain the status quo in our budgeting. For instance, for the coming fiscal year, we are projecting $28.5 million gap between our expenditures and revenues. And as you can see, the gap increases for 1920 and 2021 if we maintain the same expenditures levels. At this point, you may be wondering, but what about the increase in LCFA revenues in one-time funds that we have received? In this slide, you can see how much those increases amount to. Overall, we are getting over $35.7 million more. As I will show you in the next slide, this is not enough to cover our bills. Um, the ongoing revenues of $22.4 million is equivalent to about 582 per ADA. The one-time funds of 13.2 is equivalent to about 344 per ADA. We'll say the note in the bottom is very important. This slide shows side by side the expenditures that we have to make compared to the amount of LCFE funding that we have received. As you can see, the cost alone for our employee compensation agreements and person stairs contributions is significant exceeds the extra LCA revenues that we have received. Furthermore, covering the cost of step on color increases for employees as well as health benefits, special aid contributions, repair and maintenance, 
in child, in child development, they add to the deficit. In this slide, we further break down this cost into a specific dollar amounts. I will take you them one by one. As you can see, however, at this point, I wanna, take, I wanna pass again and be very clear that we are just looking at the LCFA funds and one-time increases in revenues and expenditures in this slide. First, our increase in revenue, again, $35.7 million. We see this on slide number seven. Now let's go line by line in the expenditure section. The increase in a step in column for certificated $2.5 million. A step on column is the move for certificated staff in the salary schedule from year to year. The amount for a step on column for classified is 645,000. The increase in health benefits or 3% is equivalent to $2.3 million. Now let's pay attention to the next two items. The increase in stairs contribution, 6.7 million. The increase in CalPERS contribution is 2.7 million. The increase to a special aid contribution from one year to another is 1.4 million. The increase to child development fund due to a funding gap, 645,000. Now we have $18 million in employee compensation. We have $3 million for retirement health benefits. I'm gonna take a moment on this. This includes the bargaining agreement that we have with our bargaining partner, SETA. Please note the minimum required under GASB is $54 million. So for a total cost, increase from one year to another, of 30, over $38 million. Leaving us in the deficit, it leaves us $3 million more in increased expenditures than increase in revenues. This is before talking about any programs. I'm going to go back to the household budget analogy for a moment. If this were a household budget, if we were a family, the question we would have to ask ourselves at this point is how much longer can we keep overdrawing our checking account and dip into our savings to pay the bills? In this slide, I will walk you year by year to answer you this question. First, we will start for the 2018 fiscal year, we over $61.5 million. That might seem like a lot if we, in our savings accounts. If we maintain the status quo, our budgeting amounts to about 11% reserve. However, after our bills for a year, we have overdrawn our checking account by $27 million, meaning we only have $34.6 million left in our account to start fiscal year 2019-20, which is about 6% reserve. If we, if we continue to maintain the budget that we have another year, another year after that, we will hand over the annual checking account for another $34.6 million. And in 2021, we will have completely run out of money. In fact, the savings accounts will actually be overdrawn by $1.5 million. Keep in mind, we are required by law to maintain a minimum of 2% reserve. At this point, we will be out of compliance with the state code. If the fund, fund balance falls under 2% reserve or gets completely wiped out, as we discussed in the previous slide, then the district will go into receivership, which is like bankruptcy. Uh, this is like shows what education 42130 means about receivership and what it will mean for the district. First, we, slew, we slip into qualified status for 2018-19, who will be subject to greater oversight 
by the Sacramento County Office of Education, SCOI, SCOI could assign to the district a financial advisor. On the bottom half of the slide, you will see if we get to negative status in 2021, it means the district will be taken over by the state appointed administrator. They could be alone by the state, and the district will have to pay it, to have to pay for it. The board will be stripped of office authority to make decisions. Finally, future contracts and negotiations will, will need to be approved by the state appointed administrator. I want to pause for a moment and remind the board that this same warning was provided in December during the presentation of the first union room. Obviously, we will, want our fund, we, we will not want our fund balance to run out. This slide shows the multi-year forecast of revenues and expenditures, along with the amount of adjustments that we will need to make each year in the millions to avoid falling under 2% reserves that we are required to maintain. These lines are the summary of the unrestricted general fund. I want you to keep an eye on the line adjustments needed to maintain reserves, or 2%. In 2018, 19, we do not make any adjustments because we have enough reserves. And then if we continue, we go for the fiscal year 2019-20, our revenues of 389,000, 39,000 and expenditures or 375, we have a deficit spending or 36 million, um, leaving us a beginning fund balance or $34.6 million. At this point, we will have to cut $12.3 million in order to maintain our minimum fund balance or 2% that is equivalent to about $10.7 million. Now we go Again, I want to emphasize, if we take care of this, the bleeding stops. If we don't, we go into fiscal year 2021, we continue our deficit, our deficit spending increases to $40 million. And look what happens to the adjustments needed to maintain reserves if we don't do anything in 1920. That amount jumps to $40.3 million. What this means is, the faster you make decisions, as painful they are, the less painful they are for our kids. The more we wait, the more difficult the decisions they are. So the fund balance of 2% in 2021 will be um, 10, $10 million. At this, um, now, I have described the fiscal situation that we find ourselves, and Ms. Gloria Chan will present a summary of the proposed budget for revenues and expenditures for 2018-19 budget. Good evening, President Ryan, Superintendent Aguilar, and members of the board. I'm going to summarize the general fund. This includes both our unrestricted and restricted resources. Our total revenues plus our fund balance is estimated at $593.7 million. One portion of our expenditures is salary and benefits. We are budgeted to spend $458.65 million on salaries in the general fund. This is 82% of total expenditures and 89% of our unrestricted funding. We are a people business. The other portion of our expenditures is our operating budget. This is comprised of books, supplies, services, capital outlay. We plan on spending $98 million in our operating budget. This includes $22.6 million in books and supplies, which includes such items as textbooks, oil, tires, gasoline, as well as our instructional materials and supplies. Total expenditures, including salaries, is $556.69 million. Taking the revenues and expenses into account, our estimated ending fund balance will be $37.02 million. Our ending fund balance includes $6 million for textbook adoption and $3 million for our expanded learning summer program. 
Within our budget, the general fund contributes to various programs. This includes a total contribution of $64.8 million to special education and $12.2 million to routine repair and maintenance. We must contribute 3% of the general fund to routine repair and maintenance by 2020-21. As you heard from our LCAP presentation, our supplemental concentration dollars are estimated to be $71.5 million, an increase of $8.76 million from the current year. Our next steps include submission to the Sacramento County Office of Education for review after board approval and the first interim financial report as of October 31st, 2018. Thank you. We are available for questions. Thank you. Do we have any public comments on this item? Yes, we do. You could come up in order, please. John Perryman, followed by Karen Sweat, Liz Guillen, Carl Pinkston, and Lamaya Coleman. Since we have fewer than 10 public comments, if we will uh, set the clock to two minutes per commenter. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Uh, more bad news. K through three class size reduction money. That's the biggest single line item in supplemental and concentration grant money. Two problems with it. Number one, it's not providing additional services for targeted students above the services for other students. I really still think it's really, really valuable. But the other part of it that seems really deceptive is you get reimbursed for it from the state in something called grade span adjustment. The reimbursement is not sent back to supplemental and concentration to be spent on interventions. It goes to the general fund. Total, we're talking about 40 million of the 70 million of supplemental and concentration grant money is not being spent appropriately on interventions for targeted students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen Sweat, Making Sense Work. In the past six years, revenues have been under projected all six years. That, and I hope you have it. That's your green sheet. Did you give it to him? You'll get it. In the past six years, expenditures have been over projected four years. At adoption, it changes. Making projections is not easy. Um, we think the revenue projections are low and they're not complete that you've been given. Uh, they don't include all the uh, strands of revenue. And we think that your ex the expenditures, again, if they're just referring to the restrict uh, unrestricted money, then they're not complete. We think that the kids deserve the budget to be discussed in terms of all of the money available to spend on the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, Carl Pinkson from Black Parallel School. You can reset the clock. We're having issues again. Sorry, Karen, they cut you off actually I know. Like a minute <laughs> early. <laughs> Thank you. We well, appreciate it. She actually set me up. So, um, And I, I, I wanted uh, Carl Pinkson from Black Parallel School Board. I kind of like want to go through a deeper dive on a couple of points she, uh, Karen made. One, uh, in terms of in the past, we've been here for about 10 years coming before this board. Uh, long before all of you who's been on this board. Uh, and we've consistently heard that revenue, it, um, it, we're, not, we're not getting enough revenue. And it's always consistently been underestimated. In the past, it was justified because we didn't have enough uh, students based on ADA. The numbers were always off. And expenditures has consistently been overexpended. And again, once again, in books and supplies, until you demonstrate for us as to why you need $22 million for books and supplies, I can guarantee you, I can bet on it, I'm going to Reno with the money to show that you're actually going to spend less for books and supplies next year. So those two. 
The other um, component that I think you also t should take a serious look at is having to do with um, in the area of, 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 of subcontract agreements. Now, it, it, it encompasses a number of different pieces, but I, I strongly suggest you take a, a, a trend analysis as to where your expenditures are looking at. The last thing, um, which I think is which is most important, that it's a little confusing. Um, Gerardo presented a picture of only the unrestricted portion of your, your disaster movie. I strongly suggest you look at both pieces and look at what was presented in the report of how much your um, uh, of the overall expenditures of driving it down. Lastly, from a political point of view. Historically, our kids have not been adequately funded for, uh, for the uh, resources that we need. During the 2009 crisis, our kids received far less and schools were closed down, and we spent more money to close down the schools than to open it. What we should be thinking about is that this money was to help our kids catch up. And I think when you re realistically really take a serious look at both a critical analysis of what the bu each budget line should look like. I think my only concern, and it's always been a concern for me consistently coming up here to talk about the budget is in the federal portion of it. I, I think he's a little bit more optimistic than I am, but I think, um, uh, I think there's the one-time money, maybe one-time money, but we've been having one-time money for almost six years now. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And Alex, this is our final public comment? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Lamaya Coleman, a parent of a kid at William Land and part of SAC Act. Um, so I just wanted to, to uh, echo some of the comments about the, over the last number of years, the, the, the Projection of how much money will be spent and how much money will come in has not mirrored what's actually happened. And I noticed in the in the graph that was shown um, that the first time that it's showing a deficit is in the year that's not yet finished recording. So in the 17, 18, which I'm I'm assuming is not the all the numbers are not yet in. So this is mm -hmm. again a projection. And so I think it's I mean we have to be fiscally responsible, and we need to also meet the needs of our kids. So I just want to comment on that. And then, um, I don't know if this is the right time to do it, but um, I just wanted to also uplift and reiterate some of the community priority coalitions, really kind of focusing, their suggestion of focusing on the most at-need schools for, school, for class size reduction. I think is really important. Um, it speaks to the supplemental and concentration funds going to those students specifically. Um, and then also um, more money for uh, restorative justice workers or uh, other support staff. Mm -hmm. so, thank thank you. you. Appreciate it. At this time, we'll take comments and questions from board members. Looks like we don't have any at this time. I do have a couple comments and questions. I, I will say that for me, um, in reviewing my board packet prior to tonight's meeting, I found this to be a very sobering uh, presentation. It was a reality check for me in many ways. Um, I, like many, you know, recognizing that there is no way that we can compensate our teachers for their value celebrated after we came to a contract. Um, however, in looking at what we're seeing as potentially two years out, finding ourselves dipping below a 2% reserve and running the risk of the potential of state receivership, one of my first questions was, how do we validate or disprove 
this fiscal analysis so that we are informed in making budget decisions. Last year, as you know, our 21st century grant did not come through for our youth development department. And I sat down with you and said, how can we find $3.2 million to backfill that money that not, did not come through for the grant? We know once again, we are millions of dollars under projection for grant revenues for youth development this year. And we have potentially $17 million of grants that will not be renewed for programs. I am very concerned as I read through the potential of having to, at a place when we are fully funded through LCFF, potentially have to make $9 million in cuts. And I say that because I do believe we need to be investing in students. So many of the things that I joined the school board to champion, like music and arts programming, haven't been viable because the resources have not materialized. I do not want to find ourselves in another situation where we're closing schools. And I do want to understand how can we be fiscally prudent in such a way that allows us to invest in student supports, in special education services, in what we know we are most efficient in right now. And so I'm going to be looking to the superintendent, to the leadership of the cabinet, and also to outside counsel to better understand how we meet the fiscal challenges before us and the obligations that we have. Um, it is very troubling to me. And frankly, in looking at a list of programs that are near and dear to my heart and recognizing that choices will have to be made in a good economic time when we're not even facing a downturn, I am terribly concerned. Um, I don't know if other board members have any thoughts that they want to add. We will be doing a special board learning session on this topic of budget on June 14th. I suspect it will be a difficult conversation given the fiscal realities, but I appreciate the presentation tonight and the comments from our public. Thank, thank you. That ends our public hearings. Moving on to item 11.0, which is our consent agenda. Do we have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Do we have a preferential vote? Uh, board member motion and second, and then the student preferential vote. I vote yes on all open session items included in the consent agenda. Thank you, board member Nguyen. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We're adopting the consent agenda. Item 12.0, communications. 12.1, employee organization reports. We will first hear from SCTA. Classes? Hi, I'm um, David Fisher, President of the Sacramento City Teachers Association. It's hard to believe that the school year is coming to an end. In some ways, it feels like it's flown by, and sometimes when I think back like to negotiations and whatnot, it seems like years ago, uh, about seven months ago exactly, we settled our contract with the district, and our contract has a number of significant advances that we've been working to implement since its ratification. First, we're extremely excited to have finally adopted an ELA curriculum after about 20 some years that will be in our classrooms when school starts this fall. We've been working hard with the academic office to ensure that all teachers receive the appropriate training to implement the new curriculum. Second, we provided the background data that should enable us to implement the new agreed upon salary, schedule, salary schedule structure that will enable us for the first time in a generation to make Sac City's salaries highly competitive with surrounding districts, especially in that mid-range area that will improve our ability to, to recruit and retain staff who reflect the diversity of our district. Third, we're hoping to reach an agreement shortly on making changes to our health plan that will allow, to allow us to protect our quality of our benefits at a more advantageous cost. With the savings enable enabling us to add, by our estimate, somewhere between 60 to 150 certificated staff that would be able to directly work with students to implement some of the goals of the LCAP as well as the um, things expressed tonight in the task force and our bargaining proposals. We're waiting for the information from the district that will enable us to make final decisions. 
Fourth, we made a proposal to the district to create the state-of-the-art restorative practices program in our district as waiting a response from the district. Fifth, we've reiterated our request to meet with the district to implement a much-needed MTSS system, another initiative that awaits response. As so does our sixth area, professional learning. Our teachers have the experience, commitment, and motivation to create the most advanced, teacher-driven, comprehensive professional learning system in California. With more than 750 of our 2,300 SETA members having five years or fewer years of experience in the district, it's incumbent on all of us to provide the support teachers need to be successful in our district. Finally, I want to conclude by once again noting that despite a lot of the annual pessimism over the budget, the state of California, along with our district, remains in the best financial position it's been in in a long time. We hope that we can get together and continue to work together to make Sac City the destination district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. SCIU? Excuse me. I'm sorry, President Ryan. We actually had one public comment on 11.1 .1 that I missed. I'm wondering if we could go back and let this gentleman speak. Sure. Go ahead. 11.1F. Approving the transgender and gender nonconforming policy. I approve that. Do it. Absolutely. I was pleased to see for the first time when I look that you're recognizing that privacy in PE locker rooms is an issue. In response to concerns expressed by recent alumni, I polled students. 75% of 10th graders, 100 sample, said privacy with respect to cell phone cameras is not an issue. But 25% said it was. And 60% of 10th graders said, given the choice, given private changing rooms and locker rooms, they would use them. I think there's an issue there. When you see capital improvement money coming by, it doesn't cost much to put up plywood benches and some tower curtains. And I think students would be grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move back to the organizational reports. Uh, TCS. Teamsters, UPE. Okay, it looks like we have none. 12.2, uh, District Parent Advisory Committees, the Community Advisory Committee, the District English Learner Advisory Committee, the Local Control Accountability Plan Parent Advisory Committee. Thank you, Tony and Frank, for sticking with us. Frank DeYoung um, on the LCAP committee, and I'm here with Tina and Kathy this evening, so you'll hear from all three of us. Uh, I would just like to say the process this year has been a very positive one. Um, I really feel, I personally feel really good about what we did this year. Um, uh, we did a good job on our comments, I felt, and uh, we gave you some process things to provide you. In the last month and a half, we've been very busy putting those together. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with the um, uh, graduation uh, committee task force, and uh, that was a very positive thing for us. And I, in the meeting, I asked and I felt the committee felt the same way, that we would have liked the opportunity to meet with them more, to have done it more than just one time because I think it really helped us too, because we could try to all be on the same page and know where we want to go. And with that, I'll turn this over to uh, Tony. Um, good evening. Um, I'm always here to give both sides of the picture. And while the, we did amazing things this year and moved the LCAP in amazing ways, there's still a long way to go with the LCAP pack. Um, our comments still are somewhat of a rubber stamp. We still need to come together and do the process. As we saw in the graduation task force, it was very interesting to watch the graduation task force go through a series of really desegregating the data, really having deep dive conversations and coming together in a way that really needed to happen across the board. We really, as a community, as you've seen all night long, 
have been asking for more of those comments to surface to the to the forefront. I mean, I've been very lucky in that last year when I talked about ethnic studies, ethnic studies actually became a line that was in the LCAP. I could see that work. The community behind the LCAP work could see that work. More work like that needs to happen across special education with African Americans. Um, it's why I sat down and didn't make any comments on the LCAP. But there are several things swirling in my mind as I think about where are the graduation task force re, um, recommendations going to lie? And in terms of that work continuing forward, how is that going to look for the LCAP pack? What kind of work is that going to look like? How much more um, work needs to be done there to make those gaps? How much work needs to be done with the SIPSs to be able so that we can align with the SIPSs and top and make sure that those comments are actually reflective of each of those communities. Um, I'm going to leave it right there. Um, one of the big, deep concerns that we did not address was ethnic studies, and that my concerns are that there will not be money moving in towards as we go forward in 2020 for this to fully implement. Thank you, Tony. I want to just briefly uh, thank the board for their interest in having the Parent Advisory Committee uh, offer advice, which we have put together in a uh, memorandum to the superintendent. And I also want to point out things that are not things that are not floated up, invisible to uh, families and to you, won't be addressed. So. Despite the way the data dashboard looks, you really have to get into the data to find out that there's a 10-point gap between young men and young women in terms of getting A through G completed. It's only 39% for uh, boys and 49% for girls. And then we've seen a lot of efforts in the high school to try to get to that A to G. And yet you saw tonight the, those many families from McClatchy whose students suddenly found themselves unable to take a class because the, everything has to be pushed into everywhere else. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but we're really happy to participate in the process. Thank you so much. And very briefly, the committee would like to, to thank the wonderful job that Kathy Morrison did uh, facilitating for us and making sure that everything got done and that we were on track. And thank you. Thank you. Item 12.3, Superintendent's Report. Thank you, President Ryan. Good evening, everyone. I want to start by first congratulating again um, Ms. Leslie McAfee from Crocker Riverside, uh, who we all had the pleasure of meeting earlier this evening, as well as uh, Mr. Brandon Parker uh, from Albert Einstein, uh, our 2018-19 Teachers of the Year. Uh, as we mentioned, they will now go on to represent our district uh, later this summer for the Sacramento County Teacher of the Year. Uh, the County Teacher of the Year will be named in August, and as you know, we were privileged last year to have two tremendous teachers um, also represented, and, and now we'll see Ms. McAfee and Mr. Uh, Parker as well. Besides congratulating uh, Ms. McAfee and Mr. Parker, I also want to congratulate once more all of the teachers that we honored uh, last week at the Teachers Appreciation Gala. It was a wonderful opportunity to reflect on the tremendous impact that teachers have on behalf of our students and our community. Each of our board members also named a teacher from their trustee area for special honors. And I just want to remind everyone because we can never celebrate our teachers enough. Uh, in Area 1, uh, Member Hansen recognized uh, Mr. Davis from C.K. McClatchy. In Area 2, um, Member Cochran recognized Ms. Chloe Williams from David Lubin Elementary School. From uh, Area 3, Member Pritchett recognized Mr. Matt Nauman from Rosemont High School. Uh, from Area 4, Second Vice President Mr. Minnick recognized uh, Alana Butterworth from Camellia Basic. From Area 5, Member uh, Vang recognized Allison McCart from John Morse Therapeutic Center. Uh, from Area 6, First Vice President Member Wu recognized Nancy Cadendoy from the School of Engineering and Sciences. 
And from Area 7, President uh, Jesse Ryan recognized Ms. Brooke Sasser from Ethel Baker Elementary. I also want to thank um, the Sacramento Unified, uh, Un Sacramento Unified Foundation, the Sacramento City Teachers Association, and several other sponsors that made the gala happen. Um, now that we're all into graduation season, I do want to remind uh, our community and families that our graduations are all live streamed. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, C.K. McClatchy and several more the following week. Uh, you can look at www.seusd.edu and um, uh, view the graduations via live stream. Um, very soon on June 18th, starting at 9, uh, our expanded summer learning programs uh, classes will start. Um, it's a short but intensive program, so it's critical that our students show up to class every day. In fact, uh, we're looking for students not to miss more than two days, um, otherwise they will be disenrolled. Um, and on that note, uh, we have begun a process in which we are phone banking each of our families to remind them uh, to make sure that they send their little ones to our program starting on June 18th. Uh, and we would welcome any volunteers who would like to phone bank uh, this Saturday here at CERNA from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, we will train you on making those phone calls, but we would very much enjoy having you accompany us. Um, we wanna make sure that we prevent passive opt-outs, um, parents who may not have read any of the information that we've sent them over the past few weeks. Um, and we think that phone banking uh, will help our parents uh, be reminded of this wonderful opportunity. Um, I also want to give a uh, special thank you uh, to all of our families who have supported our students and schools in so many ways. Uh, member uh, Wu and I were at Didion, Element, uh, Didion School uh, recognizing and celebrating uh, Mr. Norm Policar, and there was uh, many, many parents who were there uh, who had volunteered their time to help celebrate uh, his retirement. Um, I also want to um, make sure that I recognize uh, several of our board members and I, Member Minnick, uh, Member Wu, and Member Ryan, uh, joined uh, Mayor Steinberg earlier today at Sac City College, where he uh, declared that he will continue to work to address the economic disparities found in too many of our city's neighborhoods. Uh, much like we are hoping to advance our vision around equity, access, and social justice. Um, and he uh, has called for us to uh, consider extending uh, Measure U with the hope that uh, we will fund um, important services for our students across um, the city. I do want to applaud Mayor Steinberg um, and his goal to make Sacramento the model of inclusive economic growth for the nation, the city that actually starts to reverse the divide between rich and poor through education and job creation. That's a direct quote from him uh, that I thought speaks very well and is in alignment with what we hope to accomplish uh, in Sac City Unified in partnership with uh, partners like uh, the mayor and our city council members. Uh, from uh, the city of Sacramento as well as the city of Rancho Cordova. Uh, finally, I appreciate the opportunity to serve the students and families of my newly adopted home of Sacramento. Um, this is month 11, uh, so it'll be a year in July 1 that I've had the privilege to serve you as superintendent, and I just want to thank you again. Uh, enjoy the summer and keep reading and learning. Thank you, Superintendent Aguilar. Item 12.4, the President's Report. Um, I want to once again plug the phone banking that we're going to be doing for the Extended Learning Summer Program. I'm proud to say that my daughter is participating in it and that I will be part of the phone banking efforts, but we would welcome your time and volunteerism if you're available this Saturday or next week as we try and reach out to parents.
As we near the end of another school year, I wanted to take an opportunity to offer a sincere thank you to the thousands of educators and support staff that pour their energy, their creativity, their compassion, and commitment to service into our children each and every day. You are unsung heroes who choose these professions not for the pay, but because of a belief that you can make a difference in a student's life. When we say it takes a village to raise a child, you knowingly nod because you are helping to raise our children. You arrive early, stay late, wipe tears, build character, instill in our daughters and sons a sense of intellectual curiosity and limitless possibility. The work you do is sometimes thankless, but you persevere. You choose to care even the most difficult times in hopes that your words and action will not only lift student achievement, but impact a student's life. You are the teachers, administrators, cafeteria workers, janitors, nurses, social workers, district personnel, community partners, and parent volunteers that choose to invest your time and unwavering commitment in student success. There are no words that I can offer you to adequately thank you but please know that we, the Board of Education, see you and all that you do. And I, as a parent of two Sac City Unified School District children, am deeply grateful that you choose to open your heart to my children and all children throughout the year. Have a wonderful summer. And with this, we're moving on to item 12.5, student member report. Um. So the year is beginning to come to a close. The seniors are graduating, the juniors and everybody else are working on studying for finals. So um, the Student Advisory Council has been really busy with um, our elections and appointment of our new members. Um, we have, I believe, at least eight different schools out of the 13 high schools represented at our meetings, so we're super happy with that. So this is pretty much just an update of everything that we've done this year, um, the highlight being the Youth Leadership Conference, which we started last year and um, completed. The four topics were basic academics, organization, and self-study. So they learned about A through G requirements, how to get through high school. Um, the next topic was visual and performing arts, so they learned about self-expression through um, different art forms. Um, blackout poetry was the example used. We had a keynote speaker, um, to Kayla, who talked about leading through example. Um, and we're working on, we expanded this mental health and communication skills workshop to a new thing. Um, it's the survey that's at the bottom. We are working on the distribution phase of the survey, but we have gotten approval to do so. Um, one of the other things we've worked on as well is the um, analyzing how students feel in each of our specialty programs. So if you look at some of the charts, it shows just like what some of the students perceived. We're still working on getting data from all the campuses of the different specialty programs, but that's what we have so far. So this year has been very productive and very fast paced. Thank you, student board member Nguyen. We are going to miss you. You've been such an incredible representative for our youth this year. Um, item 12.7, information sharing by board members. Board member reports. First, we're going to have um, Ellen Cochran. I just have a, a brief comment to make. I come to these board meetings, I drive up 65th Street and then make the turnover to uh, the district. And when I look left on 65th Street at Hiram Johnson High School, the field is being torn up and it is being repaired. And we are going to have a new look on that campus. And that type of vis visual snapshot as you go by the school means a lot for the community. And it means the world for the students, especially the student athletes. Hiram Johnson is getting a step-by-step -step, um, progression into improvement. And I'm always very happy about it. So take a look at Hiram Johnson's field if you drive down 65th. Thank you, Board Member Cochran. Board Member Minnick. Thank you, uh, President Ryan. And I'm, thank you, uh, Member Cochran, for um, mentioning the uh, field that Hiram Johnson, I drove by 
Um, I noticed yesterday, I drive by it every day, and I noticed yesterday bulldozers, and I got some kind of butterflies in my stomach when I saw that. I was very excited. Um, I just had a couple things I wanted to say. One, I was really excited to uh, sit in and watch the uh, speeches of the candidates for the new student uh, board member uh, last week. That was really exciting to watch and watch the process as they elected their new, um, uh, their new representative. And I was extremely uh, thrilled to see that that elected um, person sat up here with you for part of the meeting tonight to get a feel for it. And I'm really excited for her uh, to, to join us. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, we mentioned it earlier when we um, looked at the um, LGBTQ pride um, resolution that uh, this is pride month and this is uh, coming up on pride weekend and uh, president uh President Ryan did mention that we will be out uh, in the parade this Sunday morning. Uh, so if any students, uh, staff, faculty, um, parents want to join us, we are going to be meeting at 10 a.m. on Sunday in parking lot X uh, outside the Crocker Museum to uh, start the parade. And uh, you can kind of search for us. We'll have a, a, a SCUSD banner uh, and so a bunch of uh, students and parents and, and teachers will be out there uh, marching in the Pride Museum. So 10 a.m., meet us for the uh, 11 a.m. parade. Thanks. Thank you, Board Member Minnick. Our final board member report is Board Member Wu. Thank you, President Ryan. And I probably won't get there till 1030 because it isn't starting till 11. But having said that. You got to come at 9. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to give a shout out to the Law Academy uh, students at uh, Hiram Johnson. They did um, uh, participatory budgeting yesterday. It was just the projects that they um, uh, presented were really, really good. And it was hard to select one out of the five that, that was presented. But I give them a lot of kudos for going through the process and learning how to do that. Um, yesterday I had the opportunity to attend the 10th anniversary of Closing the Gap. It's a, a nonprofit uh, which uh, serves to help fund other nonprofits helping to serve, uh, close the gap in our underserved communities. And it got me to thinking about how we can connect and leverage uh, from our teacher, um, teacher appreciation gala and the work and the funding that went into it from our Sac City Education Foundation and I would like to explore whether or not we can use uh, the services of the foundation to help us possibly um, close the gap in funding that we have maybe discussed today. So I'm going to be reaching out to the foundation uh, since I was your representative for the Teacher Appreciation Gala. When, when, when Member Pritchett is in town, she can come too. <laughs> And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that we can leverage that and help possibly have the foundation help us close, uh, close the gap in our funding problems. Thank you. Thank you. Item 12.7, committee reports. Do we have any committee reports tonight? Wonderful. Moving right along. 13.0, receiving business and financial information. 13.1, the enrollment and attendance report. We'll receive that information. 14.0, future board meeting dates and locations. Our next board meeting um, before our summer hiatus will be on June 21st at 4.30 p.m. at the Cerna Center. With that, I'll entertain a student motion for adjournment. Wonderful. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.